No, what we said is we don't know. But I personal think medical information. Yeah. All right. I'm not telling you if I'm pregnant either. <laughs> You're on the phone. We are going to go ahead right now and open the land use meeting of May the 19th. Um, I'm going to go ahead. We're going to start this off with Reverend LaRoche, who's here to say the uh, invocation, and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I like the meeting. Like Everyone stand, please. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Let us pray. Your God, creator of heaven and earth, we thank you, Lord, for our beautiful creation, all that you have blessed us with. Thank you, Lord, for the good weather today. Pray, Lord, over this meeting that it would go well, that, that each one of these leaders would lead and um, have wisdom in each and everything that they do, Lord. Again, Lord, we pray over the entire county uh, of Manatee. We pray that it would be blessed, that it would be fruitful, and it would grow, and continue, Lord, to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There's been some changes to uh, our public hearings. Uh, Mr. County Administrator, would you or the county attorney like to read what those okay. changes are, please? Yes. On the Cops of Plan Amendment, we have a map and text amendment. PA 1803 is a text amendment, and PA 1804 is a map amendment. Um, Mr. Barnaby, who's in the audience of any questions, represents the applicant. He's requested a continuance to a date certain of June 4th, 2021 at 1.30 p.m., but procedurally we have to open the public hearing, receive any public comment, only on the issue of the continuance, and then the motions are an update memo. And I'm just saying for the record that Commissioner Whitmore was advised that she can vote on the issue of the continuance because it's, it's a procedural motion. Right. All right, and uh, Madam Administrator, I'm sorry, County Ad Attorney, did I understand you that any public comment can only be on the continuance itself? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I just wanted to emphasize that. All right, then we're going to go ahead and I'm going to open this now to public comment. Is there anyone from the public that would like to come forward? Nope. And we have no calls. This is legislative, so they could have called in. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and close public comment. We have two motions that we need to have done. What is the pleasure of the board? So moved. Oh, well, we have well, to read you them. you got to read them. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to be? I can read it. Yes. It's right in your okay, update memo. Okay, the first motion says, I move to continue the public hearing for PA 1803, Ordinance 2117, the June 4th, 2021, at 1.30 p.m., or soon thereafter this may be heard, and to be re-advertised, and the meeting will be in this chambers. So needs to make a motion I'll second. I'll make a motion to, I'll, I'll make that motion. I'll second. We have a motion uh, by Commissioner Whitmore, a second by Commissioner Van Austinbridge. It's not on, I'm sorry, but what can I say? Um, Commissioner Cruz, did you have a comment, sir? I, I, I did. This is a little more of a, a global comment about what's going on with this. Uh, I don't know why. I'm sure there's a, a, a reason, but it, this kind of came at the last minute. I'm the first to talk about public, uh, I'm the first to talk about you know, time value of money and the need to get things done for people in Manatee County in an efficient manner. But we've got a calendar we put out at the beginning of the year, and it's, it lays out when our land use meetings are, when our regular meetings are, when our Port Authority meetings are. And to some extent, we're supposed to honor that and fit our agendas into these meetings. Like today, this Port Authority meeting was supposed to be at the Port. We are the Port Authority. It's a wholly separate, albeit identical number of people, on the Port Authority as a separate entity, the fact that we pushed that Port Authority meeting out of the port and back here just to accommodate our other job, meaning the Board of County Commissioners, bothered me in the first place because it minimizes our importance of the Port Authority. But now we have this land use meeting here and it gets pushed at the last minute after we pushed the Port Authority for it. And what's more is we're not pushing it to the next available land use meeting. That's what's supposed to be. We're supposed to have reasonable agendas that fit into the days we've afforded ourselves and the developers of Manatee County to be heard in front of this board. And 
not only are we just cramming it into the very next available day, we're creating a day solely for somebody to push this out two weeks. And what's more and a little more concerning to me is we're creating a day on a Friday afternoon in the summer. The, the people go away for weekends in the summer. People look at their calendar at the beginning of the year and say, these are the days I have to be here for land use. These days we have to be here for regular meetings. And there may have been people that already had plans. I did not, it's fine, but a Friday afternoon over the summer is a terrible time to have a land use meeting, especially one where people may come and talk because it just sounds like we're limiting the number of people who can, can show up and have this conversation. We should have certain land use days, which we do, and if you want to be on our land use agenda, you get in line and you, you find the next available spot, just like if you're trying to you know, get a dentist appointment. And if it's full, you wait till the next one. And if you continue, we look for the next available time, we can continue your time, and that can allow you to determine whether or not you want to be continued or not. To, to cram this in and create a whole day on a Friday afternoon kind of just bothers me from that standpoint. Not because of the quality of the deal. I, I, you know, I'll speak to my opinion on the deal another day, most likely on a Friday late afternoon. But th that's just my opinion. I think we should honor our calendar, and if it's full, it's full. We shouldn't be bending over backwards for developers just because they want to be heard earlier at their own convenience. Thank you. Oh. Commissioner Whitmore. Well, uh, this wasn't the developer's fault. This was an error in advertisement, and that's why it's gotten delayed. So in all respect to the developer, or whoever's speaking, we need to recognize that, which we didn't have to make public, but that's what happened. It was, a, it was two different times on two different websites, and it had to be clear for the public. As far as long meetings, you've been talking endlessly about getting this stuff off the table. I'm okay with June, I mean, 4th at 1.30 or in the morning. I don't know why they didn't pick the morning. Who knows? But I thought our, we've been talking about getting all this stuff off the table, I adding all these Wednesday meetings, so I have no <coughs> problems with that. But then, then I'm hearing you say, well, let's just wait till the next available, and then uh, you get in line. Well, remember this green sheet we're all working on? We have all this work we want to get done. I don't really care when it comes before us. So all I know it was added on Friday, and I'm here. And we go on vacation at the end of June till the end of July. So, you know, the, for those of you that haven't been here before summer break, this is nothing. We're going to get a lot of stuff added to our agenda but, so because we take off a month. And there's a lot of business to be done. So time, like you say a million times, time is money. So I have no problems with June, and if everybody can make it, great. Madam Chair, I just wanted to state <clears throat> for the record that Mr. Barbie in his letter <clears throat> did state that the reason was a, a notice issue and it was no fault of the applicant. I, and it has been no pending for a number of years. So I'm just saying that the record. It was our fault. Uh, and, and I knew that. Commissioner Bellamy? Yeah, so um, I, I'm, I'm listening to the both points, and um, I, I, I understand and I agree with um, Commissioner Cruz and, and Commissioner uh, Whitmore. My, my issue is from what Commissioner Cruz is saying, you know, the, the, the date and when these dates pop up, you know, sometimes we have things planned. I, I know right now, June the 4th, I'm not available, right? And when, when I saw that, I was like, okay, this is, yeah, this, this is going to be an issue. And I don't know how I'm going to handle it, right? So it needs to come out. Um, but I, I can say from my perspective, and it's pretty much what you're saying, things are already on the calendar based on what is we already scheduled. So, I mean, this has presented a, a, a problem for me. Nothing against the developer or anything like that, but a lot of times when these things take place, I think certain communications need to take place. You know, just that put something on it and say, okay, everybody be there. Right. We respect and we want to work and we're here to work for the citizens and things like that, but we do have other things that we're committed and things that we've scheduled in our personal and professional careers. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Mr. County Administrator. Um, yeah, I'd like, normally I wouldn't interject uh, in this, but the uh, when this came to my attention, it was clear that it was a county error which resulted in the situation. And originally staff had asked to have it added at after the recess. Mm -hmm. And I felt that it was our mistake and that the customer in this case should not be delayed because of our mistake. Uh, it's my, it was my understanding from staff that the land use agenda on the third is packed full. Uh, we are trying to get uh, uh, as much done beforehand uh, with regards to the calendar. Uh, staff checked with your assistant 
to ensure that there was availability on that day, and according to your calendars, uh, it was available. Uh, I will work with staff to ensure that they know if you have outside county business that is booked, that that time is blocked off on your calendar so we know. I know I have done that with my calendar, so school board issues and things like that are blocked on my calendar, so when we look at one's calendar, we know whether there's availability or not. I will address that. That's on me, uh, and we'll work through it. Uh, but it was, it was my direction to staff that our customers, our businesses, our citizens should not be delayed in their efforts because of a mistake that we made. And, and that's why uh, I pushed to have it put on the book of business as soon as the attorneys could agree on the earliest available time for this action to become before you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go in just for a second here. The only problem that I have, I don't have a problem with June the 4th myself. I, I mean, I don't like Fridays, but it's okay. But I am curious, and Mr. Barnett standing up there, why did we choose 1.30 instead of 9 o'clock? Because this could take some time. Because of calendars. Uh, I'm just curious. There are commissioner briefings okay. scheduled that morning. Oh, calendars. I'm sorry? There are commissioner briefings scheduled that morning. Oh, for the agenda. Oh. Okay. Madam and Chairman. And so, oh, so everyone knows working. these are not working. Yeah. So <laughs> you're going to have to yell at me or hold up because I, I can't help it. Uh, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge and then Commissioner Servia. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief and just say that I, uh, I made a comment card. Yes, I, I uh, agree with I like Commissioner that. Whitmore and, and Dr. Hopes. Uh, although I see where Commissioner Cruz is coming from, but uh, if it's our if it was, was our fault, then obviously we need to do what we can to, you know, accommodate the customer as best we can. So uh, I agree with a lot of what Cruz said, but at the same time, it's our fault. So I think we need to accommodate our customer. Thank you, Commissioner Chair. Servia. Um, yes, I, I echo those uh, sentiments too. We should do the best that we can for our customers, which are the citizens, which are the businesses, which are the nonprofits, which is this whole community. So I think it's always important to take everybody into account. And I think Dr. Hopes did a good job trying to um, get this on the next available time slot. I will encourage all of my colleagues, if you have vacation time scheduled or plans to block your calendar, because it is it does happen often, as Carol said, especially before recess. We're going to try and cram in a bunch of stuff. That's the fun part of recess. Mr. County and, Administrator. And, and, uh, and members, just, just a quick note. As I have done since the first day, as issues like this come up, we meet, I meet with staff, and we identify where controls need to be put in place so it does not occur again uh, if, if it can possibly be avoided. So we, we've addressed that. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, that's fine. Like I said, I'm here. It is what it is. But if it sounds like Commissioner Bellamy's not here, we may run into the same situation because they're allowed to continue if there's not a full board, and they may elect not to and if they think Reggie's a little sketchy on their request. But, you know, if, if they want to, they can't. You know, I didn't hear a word about the reason behind this until just now. I mean, this was, this was, pretty, this was pretty bad, uh, you know, notice. Why, why weren't we just reached out to? We get text messages all the time. We talk to each other all the time. Everyone could have just been reached out to saying, are you available Friday afternoon? Are you available Friday morning? We could have had this quick discussion this ahead test. of this. I didn't hear a word about this other than an updated agenda saying it was being it was being There closed. was an email last Madam night. Madam Chair, yes, I, I just wanted to make sure for the record, I need to him Mr. Barnaby respond to this at some point. So we have we'll have five commissioners present and able to vote on June fourth. Recollect the Commissioner Whitmore cannot participate or vote. Because that's the ethics day that they decide. No, we're not ethics opinion yet. <laughs> so, and I just if, he, if you this, can't be here, the Reggie, office okay with only five because this has been a very contentious um, issue. It's a oh, really huge issue, out. this amendment. And I want to make sure the applicants accorded due process and uh, aware there's only five present. Are you, Commissioner Whitmore, are you going to be in Tallahassee that day? I'm not going. It's it's come before the board four times and it's been cleared. I I wrote my response back. Okay. Okay. But I still um, can't vote. So if Reggie can't be here, that's why I wanted and, you to know, Madam Chair. Yeah. And, and you know, commissioners, this came up once before, and, and I can tell you the reason that it was changed from 1.30 to 9 o'clock was because the staff was trying to get as much done and try not to waste time today 
uh, in, in moving forward. So unfortunately, it was originally scheduled for 1.30. Then we changed it to 9, oh. trying to save time. And I think that's where the problem came in. Not everything was advertised or changed in the advertisement. Yeah. It was a, an error that truly um, was not intentional. So, Mr. County. Uh, Ma Madam Chair, in, in consultation with uh, council, given the conversation, I would recommend that the motion be amended uh, to have the item heard on the June 17th land use meeting uh, at 9.30 a.m. Can I, before we move forward and someone <laughs> actually makes that motion, Mr. Barnett, I've not seen an agenda for the 17th. I know you probably don't even have it completed at this point, but um, it's probably passed. what does it look like? Before our break. You have nine items that day. Uh, are they <laughs> and all, are they, excuse me, are they all quasi or legislative or both? They are both. That's what you and Rosina and I met on that huh. day was a 17th schedule because everybody's trying to get in right. before the right. recess. I got an idea. And Madam Chair, mm -hmm. and that June 3rd is really packed too. You might wind up continuing some items to June 17th. I'm a little dubious so we get through the June 3rd agenda. Okay, well, this commissioner and chairman of this board will not let a meeting go until 9 o'clock again. Never, never. So, Keep that in mind, commissioners and staff, when we're scheduling, we might need a separate day. And by the way, I know Com Commissioner Whitmer, give me a chance. Okay. Um, I know that I instructed um, staff to, you know, I said, look, I'm sure we know we're getting ready to go on recess. We always have to, um, you know, we get hit with a lot when we go on recess. The new commissioners haven't been through this yet, and I'm really sorry, but it does get crazy. So, you know, if we needed to add, to add an extra day, let's add a, a second day if it keeps us from being here until 9 o'clock. So I do have some more commissioners on the board. Mr. County, may just one second. Uh, Mr. Barnard, I didn't let you speak. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, there are three items on the 17th that we could probably move till after recess. One is the volunteer sign program yeah. that code enforcement is presenting. Uh, the other two are the LDC amendment for accessory dwelling mm -hmm. units. ADUs. Yes. We have two items, LDC, uh, the uh, ADUs. The one is the first of two required public hearings. The second item is to request the second public hearing prior to 5 p.m. Oh, right, to try to be able so to go ahead and take a vote on that. So we're going to have to have the second meeting after right. recess anyway. So we could move those three items off that agenda if the board wishes to accommodate this. Can you, I do not recall what was on there. Are there any other quasi items that might be controversial? Yes. Yes. Uh, all okay. right, Sarah already said yes. I, I was okay. afraid of that and I couldn't remember what was that on was it. That was a fast so. response. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't see any wild and crazy things on the agenda for that day. Sarah does. Sarah okay. does. Well, I think there'll be some discussion on one of them. Let's just oh, say. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, all right, well, I've got some more commissioners on the board. Commis uh, Mr. County Administrator, I'll come back. Uh, well, yes, I just sir. want to make a note okay. that we've, we've added uh, work sessions on the 9th and the 16th, so should you need that for the board's business, we can use those time slots. Budget. Okay. All right. Commissioner Whitmore. Well, 15th, we don't have a commission meeting. It's Tuesday. It's open. I don't know if we could have a designate a morning or afternoon to comply with everybody's schedule. But we have no board meeting, and we are getting close to the end of the year. And I'm telling you, for those of us that have been up here, we know that, unfortunately, it could be 9 or 10 at night if we don't. Just, just, just because of the break. Every year, we kind of got to do something like this. And in the past, nobody's been flexible. But we need to get these off now. the table. Hmm. <laughs> Is that not going to work? Well, no. I'm looking at the 15th, actually, um, to see if. I'm, we have no board meetings scheduled. You have something, right? On June 15th, I'm okay. Oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't see anything on my calendar. June 15th is good with me. I'm okay with the 15th. All of us probably are because it's a Tuesday and we normally keep Yeah, we normally have. 15th, <coughs> maybe. Oh, okay. June the 17th, we have a Port Authority meeting also that morning. Okay, how about the 15th? Yes. Which I is a Tuesday. My 
I'm looking at you, Mark. <laughs> Madam Chair, my, my hurricane preparedness uh, town hall is from 11 a.m. to noon. But on the 15th? On the 15th. But can I that could, be I changed? Could, we could do one. That. For you, I would change that. We could do you one block. So Start. Okay. Well, maybe less prepared. Like a that's safety okay. issue. Yeah. Okay. Yes, first, sir. first of all, good morning. Uh, thank you. Oh, I'm Mark hi. Barnaby for the, for the record. Um, Have you been sworn? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I promise I'm not going to. Um, uh, yeah, first of all, it's unfortunate that we had this, this issue come up. It happens. <laughs> I understand it happens. I've been in this business a long time. It happens. Um, I think the 15th will work just fine. But if you can give me about five minutes to talk to my client, because they obviously are not here, and uh, I will come right back out, and that would be wonderful. Okay. Okay. All right, we can do that, right? Yeah. No one feels five minutes like Mr. Barnett, did you have anything to add before I go back to commissioners again? I've just found that um, Mrs. Wenzel will not be here that week of the 14th through the 18th. She's going on another honeymoon. Somebody. Madam Chair, <laughs> maybe, maybe we could just direct the chair. I had three meetings and, and Mr. Barnett. at 3 o'clock with three different commissioners yesterday. I didn't know which way to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, Madam I'm, Chair, I did, would s say that, along with the lines of Mr. Von uh, Osterbridge, we've written this motion. It's going to be advertised anyway. So we yeah. don't have to know the date right now. Okay. Right. Well, hey, it's there like we there's go. a lot of moving so parts. Maybe we could just direct the chair to coordinate with the administrator and Mr. Barnott and Price there. That's good. Sort well, we'll just reformat the motion here. Tell the board members to fill in their calendars if they have plans that day that's not on their calendar. Just say out so they our assistants know that. Yeah. So one motion, you could amend the first motion to say, I move to continue the public hearing for PA 1803, ordinance 2117, to no day certain and re-advertise. Yeah. Period. Okay. Yeah. And, and, I will, and I will point out, I'm looking at my county calendar. I actually have crews out of office for the entire day on June 4th. So whoever was looking at my calendar, and, and I'm not out of it. I, I just had other stuff I was going to take care of because we had a full week, so I was going to use that day for out of office. But the point is, it was listed on my calendar as out of office, so that was not the determining factor in figuring out when we were going to reschedule this. Yeah. Well, uh, there was a block. So you, Ms. Guess, Shank, could you read that one more time? Yeah, I just said, okay, the first one would be, I move to continue the public hearing for PA 1803 on its 2117 to no day certain and re-advertise. So moved. Second. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, a second by Commissioner, was it Whitmore, I believe? Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and open this to public comment. Is there anyone that would like to come and speak on this item, the continuance to no date certain in the audience? Not seeing anyone. Do we have anyone? Uh, Seth? No phone calls. I couldn't make it. Oh. Yeah, I see it. it does. It says Cruz out of the office. Okay, so uh, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. It is approved unanimously, Madam Clerk. All right, for the second one. It would be I move to continue the public hearing for PA 1804, ordinance 2118, to no day certain to re advertise. So moved. Second. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Satcher, a second by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. However, before we vote, Opening it to public comment. Anyone want to come forward? Seth, any phone calls? Mm -hmm. Closing public comment. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Madam Clerk, it's approved unanimously. All right. Well, at this point, the only thing that we can do, we know that we have to be back here uh, at 1.30 for one item that is on the agenda. At that time, we will also go over commissioner comments. So I'm going to go ahead and recess this meeting. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Go ahead and call the meeting to order. If everyone would please stand and we'll say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, my name is Gene Brown, mayor of the city of Bradenton. I think if we can, we'll start on the left side of the room. Let's kind of go around the room and introduce ourselves to get started. I'm Bill Clegg, county attorney. Jim Keem, city of Holmes Beach. Bill Tokager, Holmes Beach police chief. Brian Williams, vice mayor, city of Palmetto. Hi, it's Gina Messenger, school board. <laughs> Misty Servia, Manatee County Commissioner. Mary Foreman, Manatee County School Board. Ken Schneider, Mayor Longbow Key. Tom Harmer, Town Manager, Longbow Key. George Cruz, Manatee County Commission. Scott Hopes, uh, County Administrator and School Board Member. Jane Coker, City of Bradenton, Ward 1. Mary Ann Barnaby, City of Bradenton, Ward 1, and Vice Mayor. Gene Brown, Mayor, City of Bradenton. Sorry. Shirley Gruber Bryant, I'm Mayor of the City of Palmetto. John Chappie, Mayor of Brayton Beach. Carol Whitmore, Manatee County Commission, District at Large. Bill Sanders, Brayton City, Brayton City Council. Vanessa Ball, Manatee County Commission, District 5. James Satcher, Manatee County Commission, District 1. Reggie Bellamy, Manatee County Commission, District 2. Dan Murphy, Mayor of Anna Maria. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Kennedy, School Board, District 2, vaccinated but still in a mask. Okay, and I think we have um, everyone's filled up. Ms. Saunders came in, so welcome. And then we also have Karen Stewart, the county, and Carl Callahan, city administrator. Um, any, Kevin came in. All right. So great. And I think this, the eight years that I've been involved with Council of Governments, there was some times that maybe didn't seem relevant as much as it could have, but this year so far, and, and this meeting shows that it's really relevant. We've got some great topics on today. Just a couple of things for the city of Bradenton, hot topics. I guess that's the benefit as, as being chair that we've got to, to say in the city. We're, we're very happy that where we are right now, we've got a great council, great staff, and we're really moving forward. Our river walk east is started up and, and really exciting. That construction hopefully will be done within the year. Um, we were voted the 11th best small city in America which to start a new business by the website nice. walletthub.com. Um, so we're proud of that, you know, that, that people are recognizing us, and that's because of everybody in this room, just not the city of Bradenton, but everybody throughout Manatee County promotes that. Um, and then just the last quick thing, or Bradenton Marauders is opening day tonight, which is good. The crowds you know, are going to be more than what they were last year, obviously, with, with COVID going through. So if you want to go out and see a, a baseball game, that's starting tonight. And the, the way they're running is they're going to be home for six days straight and then away for six days and then home. So they, the home stands are trying to really protect everybody. So that's a good thing. And then also, just to make an announcement, started getting the calls. Um, the county, city of Palmetto and city of Bradenton are sponsoring the fireworks again and this year, July 4th. So um, going to be exciting and, and going for, through that just like normal. So we are excited about that. Um, moving forward, um, we're going to go ahead with the American Rescue Plan with Karen Stewart. Good afternoon, everyone. Mayor Brown, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about the American Rescue Plan. Um, I won't take too much of your time. We'll just wait for the PowerPoint to come up in one second. Okay. So the American Rescue Plan is a $362 billion stimulus, and it will provide $195 billion to the states and the District of Columbia. 
Uh, that amount will be divided equally uh, between states, and each state would get a minimum of $500 million. Florida has the fourth largest allocation in the rescue plan, and that is based on the state's share of unemployed workers over the three-month period uh, during October through December of 2020. As some of you may know, uh, the aid from the American Rescue Plan will come directly to the counties and the cities. Uh, we, don't, we are not going through the state this time, but it's a direct um, payment from the Treasury. The county is expected to get $78.2 million, plus $12 million in the second round of emergency rental assistance. The cities will receive their own sum of money directly from the Treasury as well. And that includes $11 million for City of Bradenton, around 5.7 for Palmetto, Longbow Key, 3 million, Holmes Beach, 1.8 million, Anna Maria Island, 740,000, and Bradenton Beach, about 537,000. In addition, separate from that, the Manatee County Schools are projected to get around $39 million. As I mentioned, all of the funds will be distributed directly to local governments. And the deadline to expend these funds will be December 31st, 2024. So we have a longer time period in this stimulus. The funds will be distributed to the cities and the county and the school district um, in two allocations. The first within 60 days of enactment, so that will be by May 11th, uh, 2021. And you can get the additional 50% uh, no sooner than 12 months later. And of course, with everything with the federal government, there'll be detailed account, accounting, and um, we'll have to be, uh, provide repayment for any funds that are used in violation. So the funds can be used for a lot of the same things that the CARES Act funding could be used for, to respond or mitigate the public health emergency with respect to COVID-19, to provide government services to the extent of a reduction in revenue due, due to the emergency, and to make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. And when I talk about these uses, that's for our direct funding to the council. Uh, as, as some of you probably know, there is additional funding at the state level, and there are additional uh, funds available in the um, federal agencies as well. Um, we can use the funds for uh, many, many things, and that includes uh, vaccine distribution and health um, health care, relief for individuals and families, the uh, rental assistance, mortgage assistance, um, energy assistance for, for uh, past due electric bills and water bills and things like that, economic assistance for communities and businesses, and then also transportation, environment, and community response. Now, I'm not going to read all of these. There's several different slides with the, the different funds that are available. And this is just to illustrate how complicated the bill is. It's 650 pages long. And there are many summaries um, regarding the bill, which I've read lots of them. And depending on who the summary was written for, there's a little bit of different information in each one. Um, there's numerous funds, as I mentioned. And um, these are not included in the direct um, payment to counties and cities. So Diane, if you could just roll through those, you can see there's all kinds of different things. On the restaurant revitalization fund, which was on the previous page, I uh, just received an email from the Manatee Chamber of Commerce this week regarding this fund, which is put out um, through the Small Business Administration. And there's the availability for um, for restaurants, bars, breweries, bakeries, all kinds of food serving uh, businesses to um, participate in this by registering at a portal. And the process started on May 3rd. So um, we'll have more information about that, but that you will have gotten something from the Manatee Chamber. Um, in addition, um, there's uh, the emergency education connectivity and devices. And that kind of goes along with the um, broadband um, element that I discussed earlier. So moving through the examples to the consultant, <clears throat> so we, the county, has worked to engage Ernst & Young to develop an optimization strategy for these funds to make sure that we identify and access all of the funds that are available in the bill from the right sources and that we use the right method to get the money. 
that we match unmet needs in our community to the funding. We make sure that we don't duplicate benefits, which, you know, there's more of a potential for that when all the different organizations are getting their own um, pot of money. We want to make sure that we work together um, as a community to uh, minimize those duplications and avoid the ineligible expenses. And then, of course, um, to provide proper accounting and documentation and to disperse the funds. So um, the consultant will be providing a rapid assessment scope of work. Again, this is to identify the funding and then to facilitate discussions with impacted agencies, departments, and programs uh, with the cities, with the school district, um, and, and others who um, have a, a stake in this. They will be providing uh, recommendations to us for um, compliance and they'll develop a roadmap map and implementation plan and then along the way they'll be on-demand support. This will take about six weeks um, and we expect this to be done around mid-July. Mid so Ernst & Young um, was, was top on our list. Um, we did have an, a piggyback agreement with them through the state of Florida, but they have a lot of on-point experience. They have um, been working with more than a hundred um, different localities in 32 states. They have a unified service approach, and they adapt their approach based on real-time learning from across the nation. So while we kind of know what we've done here with business grants and nonprofit grants and mortgage assistance and those kinds of things, we'll have the um, information from Ernst & Young that shows us what's been happening across the nation. And maybe there's uh, some folks who've thought of some things that we haven't thought about yet. In addition, EY is, um, has a strong capacity. They have a legislative interpretation team. They have a Washington Council group. They're CPAs and policy analysts and economic strategists and uh, know a lot about infrastructure risk and uh, compliance. So we want to maximize the reimbursement opportunity while minimizing the downstream issues and risk exposure. So as I mentioned, uh, we executed the agreement on April 3rd. There's an opportunity for cities and school districts to piggyback based on their own procurement uh, rules. And um, our staff has set up a call to, um, to work with you on getting you attached to our agreement. We want to make sure that the costs uh, to the city and the school district who participate with us um, is that the fact that they're already doing the work for the county, that that's taken into, into consideration. They don't duplicate the work for you and charge you for it too. So we'll be working together on that. Um, we had a kickoff call on April 30th and we'll be scheduling weekly update calls. You should get, an inf you should get some information about that shortly. And um, again, we really want to make sure that we look at our, our partnerships and collaboration going forward. I have had conversations with all six mayors and the superintendent. Uh, also working together with the Chambers and the Economic Development Corporation, a nonprofit groups. I've had a conversation with the Manatee Community Foundation. I've got calls scheduled with uh, Sarasota County to see what we can do about the broadband overlap. And also um, have reached out to the Patterson Foundation as they have their project, the Digital Access for All. So our next steps will be to opt in to the first tranche of funding. Uh, we'll, you all should be looking forward to an email from the Treasury that explains to you how to do this. We'll be watching out for that and we'll let you know when uh, the county has that notification to make sure that you have it too. Uh, we'll engage our collaborators and partners and um, connect our partners to the EY agreements. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have e weekly calls with e EY over the six weeks to make sure that we all get to the same destination at the end and that we have all of our questions answered so that we can move forward. We're also working to establish a broadband working group. We have a tentative date for that of June 15th from 1 to 3, the location to be determined. And we'll be reaching out to you with further information as we go forward. Thank you, Mayor Brown. All right, thank you, Karen, and great job. And I think it's very important as we look around this room with what's gonna be coming to all of us to, to collaborate to, through the Ernst Young, and, and it's really was great to, when we talked and went through things that to know that we wanna to work together, and obviously each individual council and commission will have to decide some on their own, but, but we really appreciate the offer and opportunity to work together. So does anyone else have any questions or moving forward? 
Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, moving on, we'll move to the Piney Point. Dr. Scott Hopes and Charlie Hunsiger. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Charlie Hunsiger, Director of Parks and Natural Resources, and welcome to our distinguished elected officials and the audience in the back. I'm sure um, we've all been following this uh, situation, if we can uh, bring it up. And I might add, uh, these attachments are available at your desk because some of these exhibits are s slightly smaller to read off the screen. And they both look the same, uh, this and the boat ramp, except one important distinction. Uh, this is led off by our county administrator, Scott Hopes. So that's your key. And then the, the, second, the second page there, uh, let's go to the second page. Um, Again, for all of us who may have been away on vacation <laughs> and coming back today for uh, a quick update, uh, of course, this is the Piney Point site, which was uh, first started back in the 60s as a phosphate processing plant for turning phosphate rock into the chemicals components that we know of today as triple superphosphate and all the other components. Uh, it, it is located across from Port Manatee, and it, it, involves, it, it involved a manufacturing center that has since been dismantled and removed from the property entirely. And the legacy phosphate gypsum storage facility, that's an integral part of the chemical beneficiation uh, to create fertilizer. And this large pond uh, storage area has three, co co four container compartments holding either salt water, fresh water, or, or high strength processed water. And all four of those uh, pond volumes are not good, not good for discharge to our environment. And so the whole focus here has been to attack that. And let me go through a few uh, slides of the history again, if we've all been away. Uh, but I'll, I'll go over this very quickly because it's in detail in your handouts. But again, back in 1966, this all began with the siting of this plant opposite Port Manatee as a very positive indication for you know, building the industry and the sustainability of Port Manatee at the time. Uh, no longer necessary, of course, as Port Manatee is booming uh, with the types of uh, commerce that we're seeing today. But as we went through the process that the, the former owner of uh, uh, Mulberry finally decided to close operations, it was no longer profitable to do, for them to do so, and gave very short notice to the state of Florida, leaving the state and uh, our, our local economy and our local level kind of in a, in a lurch. Uh, a lot of funding had to be spent to, to remedy the, uh, the high strength process water that was in the containment structures located here in the photo. Well, okay, <laughs> that was located on the photo. And um, we've moved through those processes with the company HRK Holdings, LLC, who has been managing this property since basically since uh, 2006. I'll go on to the next slide. Um, the real action began, of course, um, as we all know, at the last week in March, as earlier reported cautions that the liners were patchy, they could be leaky, they could be giving a problem that was uh, brought to the state's attention, I might add, as early as July uh, of, of this year. Um, but in March, in fact, uh, July of 2020, but in March, uh, HRK started to report uh, un unusual chemistry in the water leaving the, the stack, which indicates that something's going on at the top, not at the bottom, not at the stormwater collection areas. And in fact, came came to pass where we found that um, the, the, the discharge is quickly ramped up to a, a failure in the containment structure itself and a failure of the liners. So on March 30th, under emergency orders from uh, Port Manatee, excuse me, emergency orders under DEP, uh, discharges went through Port Manatee's birth 12 location to lower the water level in the pond most at risk. And our document here just talks about the pond most at risk because there's, there's five ponds with different abbreviations, but we, we discussed the pond at risk as a, as a target here. We continue to work to get the water down in that pond at risk. And then again, on April, April 1st, April 2nd, and April 4th, uh, Governor DeSantis attended the, the site, got, received a briefing from staff, and went straight to a press conference to say this is a matter of state emergency and importance. And we are bringing together a 24-7 team of geologists from, from DEP, the Department of Environmental Emergency Management. Even the Army Corps and EPA eventually came to the site to monitor the process for 24-7. A second uh, assessment of, on April 6th finally reached the point 
where the water levels in the pond at risk that was leaking were down to a level where we felt we no longer had a danger of an emergency release of a, of a flood, so to speak, on the lands. So we had a little bit of time to step back, uh, about two or three hours of time, to determine that um, we can work with the state of Florida and the state of Florida worked with us to declare that they're in it for the long haul. That on April 13th, Governor Sanis came down with our commissioners in, in hand and announced that he had directed FDEP to develop an emergency and long-term plan for the permanent closure of the stack. No longer working through any other option or alternative to keep it a viable business enterprise for anybody, this stack is going to be permanent, cl permanently closed. As part of that closure and following that, the Senate President was also there to announce that he was working uh, with, his, with his colleagues to develop an appropriation of almost $200 million to, to meet the requirements. And that, that occurred with the announcements uh, back that followed in this legislative session all the way to the uh, 2021 budget proviso, proviso language. DEP has been with us the whole time. And I think as part of that, importantly, is the fact that Manatee County plays only the role in the long-term water management of the site. While the state of Florida continues to pursue its ultimate closure and all those steps independent of water, Manatee County is there with our deep well uh, design and construction to deal with the ultimate and final disposal of still over 440 million gallons that are still awaiting disposal and not have them, not have them be discharged to the Tampa Bay service environment. Dr. Scott. So where are we today? Uh, first of all, the, the website that is up there, uh, you can get the daily report. It comes out around three o'clock uh, every day from DEP, including uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, there is about, we start off with about 480 million gallons in that southern pond. It's down to about 205 million gallons. There's another 400 million gallons in the remaining ponds. So we still have about 600 million gallons up there. As Charlie mentioned, the, the county commission uh, before the breach went to Tallahassee asking for $6 million to help pay for a deep well for injection to help dewater. The, the plant, uh, and as you heard uh, Charlie say, at the end of the legislative session, after the crisis uh, was somewhat abated, they funded us with uh, our DEP with $100 million. Uh, so basically today, no water is leaving the Piney Point site. Uh, with the governor's assets on the ground, all of the ponds are interconnected and plumbed uh, with pumps so they can constantly move water around. The reason why that's important uh, is that one inch of rain produces about 3.7 million gallons in that southernmost pond that has the, the, the torn seam on the bottom. Next slide. The, the proviso that came out, uh, it was a full uh, effort of our local delegation, uh, the governor, the secretary of DEP, uh, they committed to basically $200 million for a total cleanup. They funded $100 million this year uh, with some of the proposals that DEP has received and that I have reviewed. Uh, I do believe that there's adequate funding to, to, to write that final chapter as the governor has said. So the leak, the leak that caused that, that, that full breach or that, that near uh, risk of the full breach uh, has been sealed. Um, and uh, an important note is no water has left the site since April 9th, uh, which is a, a, a big accomplish, accomplishment given the fact that there were, over the course of about four to five days, 220 million gallons of, of untreated uh, processed water and salt water went through the port to, to Tampa Bay. Uh, with regards to water supplies, a number of your, your residents uh, talked about a concern about their wells. Uh, the county is coordinating with the uh, Manatee County Health Department to conduct uh, analysis of well water for the residents in the area. Uh, the county commission directed the administration to, to look at a plan for, for moving the residents in that area off of wells and onto uh, county water and, and county services. Next slide. There are two different uh, uh, advanced technology companies that are on site. 
that are processing the water. Uh, one company, as of the end of the week last week, I think it had processed in between five and seven million gallons of water and returned it into the retention ponds. Uh, and it was a very effective treatment that, that really left the water at surface water standards or certainly uh, marine water standards, but it stayed on Piney Point. It did not, uh, it was not released. So uh, there has been mention about deep, the deep well. We're not gonna get into it. Uh, but as you may get questions from residents in your area, the, the county operates or has three deep wells currently. One's been operated for a number of years using, uh, uh, we're injecting effluent from the wastewater treatment. Tropicana has a deep well, and I think the city of Bradenton also has a deep well. So it's nothing new uh, to the area. The difference here is that the terms that we worked out with DEP, uh, is that the, the county will own the property that the well is on, the county will own the permit for the deep well, and the county will own the deep well, and the county will control what goes into the deep well and how long it is used. So a very different situation than one that was proposed uh, before my uh, arrival at the county. Next slide. Real quickly, you can just read this. Uh, I was impressed, those of you who have all gone through the FEMA training, and I must confess I have like four FEMA courses that I have to uh, get through and pass the test, I'm working on it. But the first course you take, it talks about the, um, the, the unified command structure. After I think the first, maybe the second day that we had our local state of emergency, we moved into that unified command process which controlled the communications. It took us about a week to get in sync with the communications to make sure everybody was, including the public, were getting the same information, but uh, we've got it set now, and um, we're, we're ready moving forward. Next slide, please. I think I pretty much covered this, uh, but what's important is that we've got a number of local agencies, University of South Florida College of Marine Science, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, and, and our own county, uh, as well as DEP, are, are, wa are monitoring the water on a, a regular basis, and in some cases, a, a daily basis. And I'll let uh, Charlie Hunsinger get into the details of what we're doing every day, so you can assure that you're, you assure your residents that we're keeping an eye on it, independent of, of anyone else. Charlie? Th yes. Th thank you again, uh, Dr. Hopes. Uh, I'm here to provide assurances in, in a way representing at least 20 scientists and support personnel that are out every day from Pinellas County, Hillsborough County, Manatee County, New College of Florida, University of South Florida, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, who are monitoring both the predictive and the predicted and the actual spread of, of a nutrient response to a discharge of over 400 million gallons. It was characterized as receiving the entire annual budget of, of balanced nutrients coming to the bay as calculated by our, our modeling in one week. So the bay, the bay is getting 300 tons of nitrogen over the year, and it got an additional 300 tons in a, in a week and a half uh, from the discharge. From the, and that is why it's so important to limit, control, and possibly end the discharges from the plants uh, in its high nutrient form. This model shows kind of like the difference between predicted and actual, and it's fairly important because there are very high-powered computer models that take into account bottom morphology, circulation, winds, tides, temperatures, and I'll just keep going, to determine how a discharge of 400 tons 300 tons of nitrogen in a one week period might behave in the environment. What will be the response out there in the water with all this new food with chlorophyll counts and other things going on? We, we predicted, I say we, the body of scientists, that we would see a response with a visible algae bloom from the surface. Possibly, you know, well, I won't even go into the red tide issue. Just a visible algae bloom from the surface. Or, or if it didn't occur in that manner, what we call the large size of algae, the, the floating stuff. Looks like uh, shredded off lettuce from a grocery store. Macroalgae, it's called. And how that might then instead respond to the food sources and, and what's occurring. Well, for two things, kind of like none of, them, not of, the, none of that has really intensely happened yet. We now know that through 
Tarpon Springs down to Fort Myers, we're getting these large mats of floating algae, the macroalgae, coming through temperature changes, nutrients that are with us, legacy nutrients, and it's happening right now. Uh, we, we see it from our fishermen that are reporting to us. We see it in our, in our shorelines where this material floats to a shore, low energy, and, and gathers. But is it driven by Piney Point? Uh, no, not yet, not now. Will it in the coming months? It could, certainly could, because that nutrient, the nitrogen, is still there in the water column. But importantly, we're not seeing the kind of spread that the computer model is showing us to expect. Uh, the, the brightest colors represent the highest concentrations in the chart on the left. And that's a computer telling us this is probably what may happen when you load this kind of food source into the water column of lower Tampa Bay and the temperature and the environment you have right now. But we can see on the right, importantly, that going out there in a boat and, and tracking where the water is, pulling samples from those locations, bringing them back and overlaying them on a map, we're not, we're not getting the spread earlier predicted by the model. It's kind of tied in. It's tied in around the, the discharge. There's no doubt about it. We're getting a response. But the heavy blue are levels of chlorophyll that are higher than what the Tampa Bay environment should receive. And how the, the Tampa Bay environment is going to react from that is another question. But it's higher than it should be. The uh, lighter blue is a level that's just slightly above it, but manageable. Offsets that we could do in normal days and weeks to try to lower that impact. The, uh, the blue that you can't even see is below uh, the levels that are going to harm the bay, in effect. But you can see this bubble. Now, that's, that's an area about four times the size of the city of Bradenton, no, no, no doubt about it. Uh, it is a significant bloom. But fortunately for us, at the moment, it's nothing. Nothing like the computer is telling us you know, it's going to flow into Sarasota Bay, Manatee River. And the question is, how do you know that? So let's look to the uh, next slide. This is why. There are four agencies out there monitoring both where we know it is and also being ahead of the, of the curve to, to monitor where it might go, where the computer is telling us it might go. All this, basically, though, is just going to tell us the severity and where it is. There's, I want to emphasize there's very little we can do in an open water environment to treat, remove, mitigate, dampen down uh, what's there virtually impossible in the volume of waters of greater and lower Tampa Bay. However, be confident that we are measuring all the way up into the Manatee River, down into Sarasota Bay, and points far north into Hillsborough so that we can at least be honest, transparent, and open. Well, folks, this is where it is, and this is what's happening with it. And this represents over 4,000 measurements, 30 days of sampling, 176 sites with data, 18 parameters monitored, seven agencies reporting, DEP, Hillsborough County, Manatee, New College, all the, all the rest. Coordinated by our estuary programs. You know, we're, we have three national estuary programs on the shores of Manatee County, unique in the United States. And now we're seeing the value, I might add, of the science that is there. We've been monitoring the bays for almost 40 years. So to describe that we know what was there before and how it's going to be changed into the future, we have that nailed down. So I want to thank you for your, your help there, and we jump right over to questions. Thank you very much. A great presentation. And when um, if you have a question you're called on, please state your name. So, Carol Whitmore, Manatee County Commissioner. I just saw, uh, for, for the public's knowledge, I think some, um, what is the long-term effects to Manatee County as well as the state um, after they close this? I know uh, there's still water that will be, it will be dewatering for like 30 or 40 years, and that's why we needed the deep well to be able to take, keep that water going in. But can somebody just educate the public so they know what the responsibility of the county is and the state? Uh, that's a great question, Commissioner. I, I will tell you what my ask has been, and the, the legislature appears to be funding it, is that as the governor refers to the final chapter for Piney Point, uh, my vision of the final chapter is that the land is turned over to us in county park quality status. Uh, and the proposals that I've seen would do just that. Uh, it would be dewatered. 
There would be new liners laid. There would be a clay cap, much like you cap a, 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 a landfill. There would be at least two feet of topsoil, and then there would be sod laid, and the berms would be smoothed out. So you basically could have a BMX park. You could have the highest soccer fields in Manatee County uh, and, and the like. And uh, I think that's where we're going to end up based on the proposals that I've seen. Okay. Thank you. Mayor? Shirley Gruber Bryant. I just uh, had one question. Um, in, in years past, I know there was some discussion that um, the, the injection well would ultimately sell space in it to other business entities. I just want to make sure that that's no longer a consideration because that, that kind of concerns me. I'm certainly no expert on it. From, from, the, from my perception uh, with, with the county commission, the, the, the largest concern that they had, and I think it's why they, they did not approve it in the past, was just that, the concern that it would become a commercial enterprise. We have the problem at Piney Point today because DEP sold it to a company who intended to operate it as a waste site for commercial purposes. So what, what I proposed to the county commission uh, and, and they approved, as I mentioned, is the county will own the land. Uh, right now we're working on a deal with DEP where we had drilled a test well uh, a number of years ago, which is on the Piney Point site. Uh, that property would revert to Manatee County government uh, so we would own the property, we would own the well, we would own the permit, and the permit's important because that's, that's what determines who gets to say what goes in it. Uh, in addition to that, the, the county will own the pre-processing equipment that connects to the well uh, so, that, so that local government can make the decision uh, what it's used for, how long it's used for, and, and if, if use is stopped. But I do not anticipate uh, from this county commission and from this administrator that it would turn into a commercial enterprise. Thank you. Commissioner. Brian Williams. Dr. Hopes, a great presentation, but I have concerns about the injection well. Um, what kind of uh, test sites? You're going to have test sites, deep well test sites, and other areas throughout the county so we see what the migration might be into other aquifers. Is that being planned? Well, as, as I mentioned, there, there are five deep wells currently in the county. Each of those wells also has a monitoring well. Look at the engineering. This is not new science. This, is, this has been around for a couple of decades at least. Uh, the fortunate thing for Manatee County and for this site is that in the deep wells, you're, you're going down about 3,000 feet, 3,000 to 3,500 feet. And that is, that is well into the lower aquifer, which is salt water. And that water moves from east to west. Uh, where Pawnee Point is located, you can, you can see the, the port from it. And so when it goes down, it's, it's going nowhere except under the Gulf of Mexico, under Tampa Bay. And it's a slow migration uh, to the west, way out uh, below the Gulf of Mexico. So as I said, we've had very successful uh, 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 use of deep wells in Manatee County with Tropicana, with the city of Bradenton, and the three wells that uh, county government currently has. Okay, our ASR well is down a third of the way down there approximately, so I don't know how it might migrate even back up a little bit. I know you say it goes east-west, but will it affect our bubble that's under there? No, no. What's interesting is when you, you, you look at the engineering, you've got like a casing, you've got mortar or cement, another casing, mortar, cement, another casing, mortar, cement, another casing, so that you've got multiple layers well through about 2,000 feet uh, before you get into where you only have a, you know, three, three layers around the well before you get to the injection point. And then you have a, a monitoring well that, that picks up specimens from around 1,500 feet. So you know well before if, if there were to be a problem in the substrate, uh, which the science is pretty, pretty supportive that that won't occur, you'll get an indication from that monitoring well before it ever leaves the saltwater aquifer. Okay, and will we get uh, copies of reports that from the test wells and so forth? So we'll sure, know absolutely, what they put in absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And I'm happy to provide the engineering report. I mean, I think it's public. It's a public document. So, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. And I just want to thank you know, from the other municipalities and, and government entities and all the citizens, what a great job the county commissioners did. I know it's something that. 
a lot of people think, well, it's the government right now. It was the government from a long time ago uh, <laughs> that wasn't the government. It was a private citizen or company. But the government now is doing a great job. And Dr. Hopes, welcome aboard. Thank you. So, All right, moving on, we'll go to a brief review of county boat ramp capacity. Charlie and Alan. No, that's right. Okay, uh, again, thank you, Ma Mayor Brown and members of the elected uh, group here assembled. Uh, the title of this presentation is Manti County Boat Wrap Capacity and Future Plans. Uh, again, that colored sheet, a little bit different. And uh, this is a much shorter presentation just to talk to a little bit about where we are as a county working towards boat ramp capacity. And Lord knows, uh, for the 30 years that I was aware that we had a boat ramp shortage, um, we've been really trying to find additional capacity. And in those 30 years, we've really only been able to find one additional ramp on the Palma Sola Causeway. And we've made improvements to the ramps that we have for traffic circulation and launch capacity, adding some parking where we can squeeze it out, uh, adding and improving the access to the water with continuous dredging and maintenance. But we have, we're in a coastal county uh, of land of flats. Uh, we don't have the kind of deep water up close to a shore that you might have uh, uh, up the coast of the Atlantic. Uh, I don't know how people in Homosassa get out to the water or Cedar Key because it's even worse there. But here, every time we try to launch for a facility, if, if a channel is not already present, we have to dredge to find our way to deep and navigable water at very, very high cost. That shouldn't stop us, however. But again, as a coastal county, we are facing the legacy of development. Uh, there's very few open parcels here that do not have a structure on them or plans for a structure, which to take the prices for the type of boat ramp spaces we need, take them right out of sight. This shows, the next slide shows the existing ramps that are owned and operated by Atlantic County. A scant few. And what's missing here? Something north of the Manti River. Uh, why aren't there any? I'll have to talk about that in just a moment. But our ramps... Uh, cover the waterfront, so to speak, from a coastal access all the way back to the two good freshwater ramps, I might add, where you don't have to drive 40 miles inland at Jigs Landing and on Lake Manatee. But we'll go on to the next slide because you know, everybody knows where they are, but how they're serving the community. And again, launch lanes and trailer spaces work hand in hand. We could put in six launch lanes and 12 parking spaces and they'd be empty. We could put in 100 parking spaces and three launch lanes, and the level of frustration would be even higher. Uh, so they work in balance, a number of lanes, about one launch lane to about 18 to 25 parking spaces is about as much as you can expect to have and not get frustration at the launch lane itself, people coming and going off that capacity. So we, we've tried to find a kind of a balance out there where we can. And you can see from this slide and some of the more close-up opportunities here at your, at your tables, that we have only 253 trailer spaces and 16 launch lanes. A county of 400,000 plus probably should have double what you see here, easy. But we also um, are trying to find about, you know, thinking about the future. Uh, there are two particular properties uh, where we have a reasonable chance uh, through partnerships and ownership to increase the parking, and that's the box to the right future plan parking expansions. At Fort Hamer, there's room on the uh, both sides of the Fort Hamer Bridge, a little more organization to the parking that takes place there every weekend, and we all see it. 36 additional trailer spaces could be provided, but in fact, to take care of the 36 additional trailers that are already parked there every weekend all over the place. And we try to bring them in, the right, the exits rows in, ramps out, trying to get people in an organized fashion. Not much more room there, however, for that. Uh, at Kingfish Boat Ramp, uh, we are undertaking a, an expansion that is probably 60% through its design that are going to yield an additional 20 additional parking spaces when we complete that. And I want to look to my colleague, Alan Lyhip, who's in the audience, I hope. Is he standing up there in the back somewhere? No. Okay, he's right behind me. Good. I hope I'm good with that. Um, with the bridges? Okay. 
Thank you. I, I knew I was wrong. Uh, always ask the expert. Uh, 20 additional trailer spaces are going to be made possible when DOT completes its bridge replacement at that site. And that is a decade away. Easy. Well, then what about the, dream, the dreamers of all of us? Well, some of this is a dream, but others a very serious and, and viable partnership. Uh, the next slide talks about a partnership with the Manti Fruit Company, uh, currently you know, Chair President White and Preston. And we have been speaking with Mr. Preston uh, and his representatives for on their eight years or more about a public and private partnership that would occur when that, that when the owner decides to pull the trigger on a development plan that is, is in place on paper for the virtually all of the farmland you see there in the illustration. And they are desiring to build a, a private uh, boat access to Palmasola Bay along a dedicated channel cut through uplands, not trying to work that, that little filled-in channel next to sunny shores, but a new channel through uplands to get back to that star. And have invited us, literally, to, to join with them if we desire uh, to fund a, private, a public parking lot and a public launch ramp that could be dedicated and used by the public while their private uses occur on literally the other side of the pond that will be created at that star. This is a viable opportunity for us to, to move forward with, a, I'm going to say, almost a 50 cents on the dollar deal to create a capacity for um, 80 parking trailer spaces and further access to Palmasola Bay. You say to yourself, what does that do for things north of the river? Not much, but it does relieve, importantly, the pressure on Kikina South and North boat ramps, even on Kingfish, and the, the traffic load that that places each and every day. So we are very anxious to continue our discussions with the, what, the Preston family and the development interests there to make this public-private partnership the first in Manatee County as it relates to marine work happen. The second slide is a proposal uh, for those of you who remember uh, County Commissioner Joe McClash, um, working with him uh, almost 18 years ago, a charrette was held in this very room with DEP, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, importantly, Florida Department of Transportation, Hillsborough County, Pinellas County, and other leaders and in interested parties and those who are saying, now, wait a minute, your boat ramp there? But we all came together for a whole day session about what might happen if we could move enough m new material to actually fill in a bay bottom adjacent to that bridge. This is on, this is just up the road from the southern rest stop on the western side, the Texas side of the Skyway. And you can see there uh, with a fill pad to create trailer parking, six launch lanes, and imagine the access. Uh, once you're on I-75, there's no more stoplights to drive to this location and launch to all of Tampa Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. How can you fill in land like this, you say? Well, look at what, look at what we're working from. It was filled in, uh, and, and it's going to be a tough haul, and we're going to have seagrasses we're going to have to mitigate for. Uh, possibly the material that we have to fill here could come from Port Manatee. What a great idea that would be. As they time their expansion with their port, some of the material they need to dispose of could be brought here and filled in that pad. And so it, it's, it's kind of like our, our, our home run, you know, our home run shot. There's no guarantee at this moment that it's permittable. Uh, there's no guarantee that uh, the financial attributes can be affordable. But when we're looking at a significant push for boat ramp capacity north of the Manatee River, uh, this is it. Hillsborough would use it, Pinellas would use it, and they'd say, well, what about our, and they, we would ask them to participate, and maybe in exchange for the participation, we set aside maybe 20 spaces for Hillsborough, 20 for Pinellas that they can use, so that no one county loads it up to the exclusion of all the public. There'll be a way to manage that if we can pull it, pull it together. But this is our, well, anyway, this is our, uh, our first draft pick for this property. Lastly, 
one more shot. Again, manatee fruit. Again, teresia. Again, a much more sensitive environment, but nonetheless accessible if we push through a dredging to, to make it through that shallow shoreline to get out into Teresia Bay. Now, I want to emphasize that this proposal was something that we talked about. I, I spoke to Whiting Preston about four years ago. When we, at that time, we were still looking for some place, somehow, to bring ramp capacity to the north of the river. And uh, he said, well, you know, if, if uh, Peninsula Bay works out for us, I see that come along pretty well. Uh, it's a good partnership so far, and that was four years ago. Uh, maybe we can carry that idea forward in some of the property we have up here in north, north of Palmetto. And uh, I said, we're all in. Uh, can we continue talking? And that's the only level. We've not done a plan. We've not done a feasibility exercise. But when we look at the shallows and the available property and the constraints of, of the environment and the economy, uh, I'm afraid to say, uh, at the end of the day, this is about it. Skyway here. At one time, we looked at a boat ramp next to the port where the B-Line ferry used to dock. There's deep water there. We own a very small par area for parking. But in talking to the port, and unfortunately, there's not anybody here today, their expansion plans are going so great, so robust, that the expansion beyond the next five years plan for a berth expansion comes into play a new berth uh, north of the existing port in, in a location that would really either touch up against or limit or worse, prohibit the continued use of a ramp at the, sky, at the at Port Manatee. So as we push for a possible five or six or seven million dollar boat ramp, I know Commissioner Satcher, I told you one time, well, it's just only going to be $2 million until my, my experts told me, no, no, there's environmental damages there that would have to be mitigated and that's going to take you right to the bank. And so we don't want to make that investment only to have the boat ramp close in the next decade. If we're going to spend money, we need to put it on our number one draft pick at the Skyway. And that's where we are. Um, and. I feel like the person that says, and if you have any other homes for sale in the area, let me know. Uh, if you feel like there's any other property where property owners are interested in partnering with Manatee County, uh, we are open for, for business. Please uh, send them our way. So thank you. Okay, um, we'll go to questions and uh, please state your name as you get ready, um, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Kevin Van Austin Bridge. Thank you, Charlie. It was a fantastic presentation. Um, you and I have discussed this at length. And uh, I, I'm the District 3 Commissioner, so West Bradenton, the Penn Bay property, uh, is located in my district. And I spoke with Whiting Preston last week. And this is not something that would be you know, 20 years out in the future. Um, they are ready to start moving forward and going vertical at Penn Bay as soon as possible. Uh, they already have their site plan approvals, and so you know they could start moving dirt sooner than later at Penn Bay. But we do have to start the permitting process for the channel right away with the county partnering with them on that, and that will become come to the board sooner than later to vote on partnering with them on that channel. Um, and yes, 50-50 split. But of course, we'd be getting the land for nothing, so we're 50-50 split on the build out. So we'd actually be doing better than 50-50 on that. And uh, and Charlie, I'm a huge supporter of the Skyway idea. I think you could easily put 200 spaces out there. Um, and as far as partnering with other counties, maybe we, you know, our folks could park for free and we could just charge them and let Pinellas County pay for it. So, but thank you very much for the presentation. I love it. And you know, the Army Corps, the, the channel has to be dredged at the port, and the Army Corps has to put that material somewhere. Um, beach renourishment, you know, we can move the, the the sand eight miles through those through that piping, and it's only according to my realtor MLS app, it's only 4.1 miles from the port to the to the Skyway. So, you know, that's one fashion in which they could move that that sand. So it, it, it is a viable option, I think. So thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Commissioner Williams. Yes, Charlie, uh, if we could see that last slide, I'd like to point something out to you because just north of the last, uh, the yellow, last yellow one up there, there's one more spot and that's Peterson Bayou that uh, yeah. is already the same depth of water as outside, and you can see a small channel there. Yeah. Um, that would be a good place to put in 
if you put a ramp right to the to the south or just directly east of the yellow triangle there. Y yes, sir. We we did look at that, and uh, we're we're thinking from a standpoint of two two factors. The triangular pieces already have some form of a road to get to them. Uh, Peterson Bayou is pretty much uh, land not not accessible right now from what we can see f by a current road. Um, um, just lost it, but in addition, uh, Alan, Peterson Bayou is probably more a sensitive environment. Do you want to comment on that at all, uh, Peterson? As an as an, a fourth fourth location? Yeah. Well, okay, uh, maybe not. So, of course. Just want to throw yes, it in Yes, we will. There. Yes, we had, we had that, uh, that, and you're right, because if that picture is still up there again, uh, it seems to be a, a, a kind of like a natural channel, doesn't it, through that sandbar yes. that's off front of there? Because yep. with each tidal exchange, that bay empties through that, through that spot. That just tears you can put bay. floating docks around the perimeter of it and everything, so. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Bryant. Shirley Groover Bryant. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Dr. Hopes and the County Commission for allowing this to be added. And, you know, Charlie, I'm a great fan of so many of your projects. There's been a lot of concern. And, you know, when I, when I saw the listing of, you know, how many boat ramps there were, I, wa I thought that it was only fair to bring this to the county and, and to update that information. So I really do appreciate the presentation today. So thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. Just real quick, um, the cities, uh, if you would all work with us to uh, the Skyway, we've tried this a couple times. It's really hard to get, but I think if we all come as a unified approach and um, at one voice, I think the county's always just tried to do this on their own, but this is a perfect, There's uh, according to this, there's 200 parking spots and, and that's what we need. Also, I serve as chair of the WCIND, which is the um, state agency for the navigation for the channels. If we have some kind of plan sooner than later, it would be good so we could put it in that plan to help with funding. And also, Charlie and I serve on the Gulf Coast Consortium from the BP oil spill monies. I think we got $4 million for Kingfish, and that's what's taken so long because we had to get the appropriations from the Treasury, and I think we just got it, or are we waiting? Very, no, very very close. We're very close, but that's what the holdup is on Kingfish, because we, we only can close one boat ramp at a time. So, but I really think if the cities, and that we definitely need more boat ramps in Manatee County, that if we would all work, if you would work with the counties and support and any contacts and help you can get, I think the Skyway, and we all think for years, that this has been the best approach, because we can get all these parking spots, and. Um, Get some of the boat traffic off of the smaller roads and the, the you know in Manatee County. So I think that's a good idea. Thank you, Chair Ball. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was just going to say, and Carol hit on a lot of what I was going to say. I think this is absolutely the best location in Manatee, and and I did notice that I didn't see uh, the one there near the port. Did you give up on that one, or you gave up yeah, on that? I think uh, oh, right. Yeah, only because port expansion will overtake it, right. and then. Decade or more. Yeah, and that's what I was concerned about with that. But I think, you know, if we all come together uh, on this Skyway Bridge boat ramp, I think that we can make a difference working together as a region. And also, if you contact Hillsborough and we have them on board and we work together, I mean, it, it will probably actually take place and it'll be great for both counties. So this is excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Commissioner? I just want to say that you know we have 21, 000, over 21,000 registered boats in the, in the county, and to only have 253 parking places, it's a problem, and it's not any individual municipality's problem. We're having some lively discussions right now, and I, I think that by having us proceed on doing something in the county level that it will take some of the pressure off. But what time frame are we looking at? Are we going to just look at one 200 boat ramp? That's still not enough. You've got to go further than just the one ramp. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Satcher. Uh, James Satcher, District 1. Um, so just this issue in general, um, I'm, I'm disappointed 
uh, in this issue. I mean, I'm disappointed that we're here and having this discussion and the things that I see driving the discussion. Um, you know, the people that are in this room, the citizens that are in this room, uh, they're disappointed that right now 100 parking spaces are being taken away from them. Um, I'm disappointed in that too. Um, and to say that, well, we need to, you know, magically create 200 parking spaces uh, in six months, I'm all for that. Uh, I was working on that since I got in office. Um, I've been, I've had Charlie in my office multiple times. Uh, we spent serious time talking about this, uh, trying to figure out spots, trying to figure out ways. Uh, you get into environment, you get into um, permitting, you get into dredging, and you know what keeps crossing my mind is, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if we already had a perfect place for a lot of boaters to be able to take off from? Um, and so we as a county, you know, in this commission, from what I've seen, we step up and we try to take care of the people when we can because that's our only job, really. I shouldn't use the phrase take care of. There's a better phrase out there. But to serve the people and to do their interests um, in things that, uh, that we have to. I feel like that's our only real role. And uh, when we fail at that, we really fail. And we're all sitting here dealing. Uh, the first part of this discussion was about Piney Point. And just about none of us, really none of us here, made the decisions that led to Piney Point. But the people that did make that decision were all thinking short term and weren't thinking about putting people first. Um, and so the commission, you know, in November we voted and said, this is a serious danger. Um, this is a serious danger to the environment. Let's step up, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's unpopular, uh, and let's make the decisions that we need to make to get this addressed. Sad thing is we were as I say, a day late and a dollar short. You know, it, it came to a head before we could get the get the issue addressed. And uh, this just seems like the same kind of thinking that here we are and uh, we've already got a problem. I promise you we're working on fixing it. Um, you know, people in my district, they want a place to play soccer. They want a place to put in their boats. And those are my people. They, they voted for me. Um, you know, uh, the largest district in the county, the most people voted for me overwhelmingly. I want to go to work for them. I want to get their concerns addressed. Um, and I'm looking for any route we can do. So if that's Whiting Preston, what a great guy, and what a great partner. I'm looking forward to that working out. Uh, if that's the Skyway, that's great too. Um, but here we are already with one nostril above water and then uh, you know, throwing us a baby in the middle of it might not be um, a good partnership between governments. But that seems to be the situation we're in, and we'll deal with it because we can. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bellamy. Yeah, I probably got a little different. I'm, I'm with you, um, Commissioner Williams. As far as um, looking at a timeline, I, I think if we're going to attempt to embrace the Skyway Bridge um, boat ramp, we do need to look and identify how we're going to bring those collaborations forward so we can hear back from you all with a timeline. I, I think the real issue, um, and I've met with the mayor on this and, and talked to some other people. Um, we really need to look at that North River launch capacity. And I'm not necessarily sure um, other areas. I think when we talk about um, the one that, that Kevin um, brought up, that's obviously going to be um, on, the, on the other side. Our, our issue is, is North River, what, what, what the concern is now. And, 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 I'm, and I'm with you on that as far as identifying different locations that we can um, potentially increase the launch capacity. Um, and I asked Charlie this as far as, you know, how many can we get from Fort Hamer and what are the other areas that we can identify? And we are attempting to do that north of the river. We're attempting to do that. But I think before we leave here today, if it's possible, are we going to embrace the Skyway Bridge boat ramp? Um, everybody seems to be on 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 on, on board well some people seem to be on board but i would like for us to embrace that so we can at least say we know that we have 200 i tell you what 200 coming is better than nothing coming <laughs> and we can look forward to it and, and then if we have the municipalities and everybody on board that's a step anything in life you got to crawl before you can walk and this is the issue that has you know we we all know we have a growth issue here Let's let's be honest. We all we we all know we have a growth issue, and with the 21,000 um, registered voters, we do understand that number. 
But our options right now is the Skyway Bridge. So what can we do in order for us to move forward on that and embrace it? Yes, Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you very much. And I think the Skyway Bridge sounds like a really great idea uh, and maybe taking the first step to see if it's even permittable and how we would partner and, you know, an, just a ballpark estimate of the cost because we don't know if it's an affordable option. There are a lot of questions to begin answering. And so maybe taking that first step makes some sense. Thank you. Commissioner Ball. Well, ironically, I totally agree with, with Commissioner uh, Servia. I think we do need to look at this um, and take, because really there are no other options available to us right now. This is the best option. And so who's to say that we won't find, like, you know, another location? I mean, we'd love to have more than just one more. So, you know, let's go ahead and, and, and work on this one and then keep looking for more so we can add more boat ramps. I mean, I think that's the whole, that's the whole thing about it. I do have a question on the, the uh, planned future parking expansion, the Fort Hammer and Kingfish. Is there any time frame on those? <clears throat> a Fort Hamer expansion uh, has to work its way through state approvals and uh, would begin in uh, 22 and into 23 uh, in terms of uh, actual pr provisions. Now, uh, I might add that the temporary parking that's taking place by most folks who drive 30 miles to find out they don't have a parking spot on the pavement is, is operating right now. And so we're, we're not able to really, I, I mentioned that to say we're already got 18 to 20 trailers there every weekend not in the parking lot and we're trying to control that in a better way uh, so we we can't really look towards a, a doubling of capacity because we're already there but we are we are going to mention that one lane per parking space ratio um, it, it can get clogged up there we are going to be looking at effectively doubling uh, the size of the Fort Hamer ramp uh, to the east take what's there we build it right here and and widen more launch lanes to, to match the parking we're going to add in on a permanent permanent manner. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and Mayor, I might also add, uh, Mayor Brown, that the last boat ramp we built in the last uh, 25 years was made possible, began with, and was initiated by the city of Bradenton on the Palmasola Causeway. And uh, you know, thankful, thankfully, thankfully that you were able to get that permit and constructed. We've we've taken it up now to manage it and, and make a few changes for some of the ADA requirements that came to us in the last couple of years. But um, that that ramp did not happen without the city of Bradenton um, beginning the process. That's Thank great. you. Thank you. And I think that as we've seen, and and I speak for myself right now, and I would hope our council would that city of Bradenton would be glad to help in any way we can if we're going to do something with the Skyway moving forward to make it better because it's not just the county's problem it's all of ours which is to work together and try to work things out and and again I think that you know there's an issue out there now but it really it's not something taken away that was a no good deed goes unpunished at times and the the city is really trying to work and, and make things better so appreciate that and I think if hopefully folks out there will listen and understand the processes that are happening and know that this group as well as the county is working forward so okay. trying to get spaces as quick as they can Thank you. Thank you. all right moving on update from town of longboat key mayor and tom Thank you, Mayor. I'll do a quick intro and our project manager for our nourishment project Charlie mops is here and will provide an overview and help answer any questions you may have I'll just start off saying the town, I think, is really busy right now with our undergrounding. We have a, almost a $50 million undergrounding project for the entire island. We also uh, were bored, so we snuck in a nourishment project for about $35 million that we're now started in March that you're going to hear about. We're also building a new st fire station, renovating a second one, and working on a new town center. So uh, just here today to talk about the nourishment project. And I would say we all know it's a cycle. And so we're in that cycle again on Longboat Key. We last nourished our beach in 2016, and good or bad, that was a truck haul. So we brought in most of the sand through trucks, you know, a lot of trucks, like 200 trucks a day kind of truck haul. 
And, and this time we're dredging all of the sand, either from Passage Key or from Longboat Pass. We appreciate the partnership with Manatee County, both on coordinating with the pass as well as some of the work that's occurring on Greer Island. The current effort's about 800,000 cubic yards. I don't want to steal all of Charlie's comments, but it includes constructing uh, groins uh, on and next to Greer Island, and, and again, uh, a bit of a partnership there with Manatee County. So with that, uh, our project manager, uh, Charlie Mops, is here to provide an overview. Thank you. Town leaders, uh, sorry, community leaders, because uh, I work with the town leaders. Uh, next slide, I'm Charlie Mops. I'm the project manager for the town of Longbow Key, as Tom addressed. Um, what we have in the first, uh, well, the first slide or the second actual slide is, you know, there's a project website that we created and through our consultant, Olson Engineering. And in, in that is probably one of the best sources of communication that we've had. We're able to direct citizens to it all the time and help manage the expectations of the project and help manage the communications of the project through that website. I really do recommend that if anybody wants to visit it, please do, because it does have a lot of great, not only images, but interactive maps and everything else that really tell the tale of what we're doing out there to put 800,000 cubic yards of sand on our shores within the next six months. So we, like Tom said, we have, we have six really ongoing projects. One is a, is a potential future project, which is number six. But as Tom alluded to, number one, which was the North End structures in Guerrero Island, that consists of, and, and um, if you can go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll talk through this slide with it. On the North End segment, that, go, that has five structures going on, so five rock groin structures, and they're going to be backfilling those structures, doing dune planting and everything else, and that's all up at the, the Greer Island North Shore area. And the Central Key area, which is segment number two, which is the big segment that you see in yellow, goes from Tiffany Plaza all the way south to uh, Sunset Beach. So, you know, the northern part of that is in Mantee County. That is our, our biggest section, but currently, because we got Weeks Marine doing the, the construction, they're averaging about 20,000 cubic yards a day of placement on, on our beaches. And so they're already halfway done with that segment. So going into segment three, which is the very southern segment of the current project that Weeks is doing, that one is already done. You know, so that they, they completed that project. They started it at the beginning of April and they finished it in the middle of April. And so then they just moved right on up because they're, they're pushing some equipment, running 24 seven, and they're doing a really good job. Uh, number four, Gulfside Road, which is the small segment that we have two extremely erosional parts of our island. One is segment one and the second one is segment two. Number one is because we have inlet dynamics that are interacting with just coastal dynamics and it creates nodal points so you have sand wanting to travel in both directions, north and south. Typically on the west coast of Florida, sand does want to travel from the north to the south through crush shore and longshore currents. That's just, that's just coastal processes. Whitney Beach, that whole area is really affected by two big seawalls that jet way out into uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And because of those, you have downdrift erosional signatures, and it's really hard to keep sand in front of a big flat seawall. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody here who's seen dredge projects or seen beach nourishment projects will actually recognize that. So with that one, we happen to have, and this is the, the thank you again to Manatee County, they were getting done with a smaller FEMA project to do the south end of Coquina Beach with a, uh, um, a contract called Cottrell. And so we happen to ask Cottrell at the end of that project, not to interfere with it, would you be willing to continue, because there was still some material left within that pass in order to uh, you know, nourish the Gulf, the Gulf side areas or segment, uh, segment four? And they said yes. And they said yes to $16 per cubic yard. And that is huge, because as Tom alluded to, the 2016 project, when we truck hauled, that's $50 to $60 per cubic yard to get that sand placed on a beach. And having a, a contractor right there and willing to do the work and for that level, in that level of effort and that level of savings is, was, was just a wonderful thing. And, like, and they did a great job. I mean, they pushed through that project really, really well. And then the last one is just a southern project. I know it's in Sarasota County, but it kind of ties, if you tie all the beaches into one u uniform shape, it's what helps keep it on you know, where you place it. So we're looking at actually potentially accelerating that project into this year because that same contractor had another contract, you know, Cottrell up in, uh, up in between Georgia and, and Florida, 
up at Kings Bay. Uh, they were going to do a big uh, Army Corps project, but that one probably got delayed. So they're willing to now accelerate their, that project and maybe get some more sand put on our beaches. Next slide. So as we talked about, the main concern for obviously Mantee County, because Mantee County owns a good chunk of Greer Island, it's, it's one part of their park system, is the area that we're, we're, you see here, we have a couple of major washover areas that, that always happen every time we have a hurricane or a tropical storm happen, you have these big washover areas that really take sand off the, the front edge of that beach and push it into that, that, that lagoon area. And in that lagoon area is a lot of wonderful seagrass. Well, guess what happens when you put sand on top of seagrass? It dies. And so one of the reasons, another reasons why, or one of the many reasons why we do beach project is for the environment. You know, if we can create turtle and shorebird nesting habitat, and we can create higher elevated beaches to prevent the, you know, um, storm surge, you know, you're providing storm surge protection, and then also for the recreational value of it. So this is just a, a, a a post at a um, picture that we took, and you can see where the uh, the washovers happen. Next, next slide. So here we are. We're trying to protect that one washover, the big washover area. And how we do that? We put a big groin there, and that's N3. N3 is the the northern groin, which Kelly Brothers, which is a sub to Weeks, is currently uh, constructing. They're working both at the landward tie-in right now, and they're working on the outside. So they're trying to connect the dot, you know, connect the T and and with the middle. And right now, they're probably about 80% complete with that construction of that, and then they'll be moving to the next, the next uh, uh, rock groin structure, which I'll talk about in a minute. Next slide. So as you can see, construction continues. And in it, like I said, they were working on the inside and they're working on the outside so we can tie those two ends together. Reason for that was they were running into some serious seas. We've had some really wicked fronts lately. We've had a lot of very you know, uh, strong wave and wind action out there, which is really preventing their barges from successfully placing, not just dropping, but placing the rocks to, to meet the engineered desire. Next slide. So in it, you have the, the, the three northern groins, which is in the Manatee County, well, the two northern ones are in Manatee County property. And then, uh, so it's N3, N2, and N1. And Again, if you see where they're being placed, they're pretty much being placed where you have those continuous washover areas. Well, one of the one of the things that we've always we've been getting a lot of calls of concern with is there's a it's very picturesque up there in order to you know for people to go. There's a lot of a lot of fallen trees. There's a lot of driftwood. It's a lot of place. It's a place where a lot of people take their honeymoon pictures and they take you know their engagement photos and stuff like that. And there was a, a strong desire not to just disturb too much of what, what was aesthetically pleasing up there. Well, unfortunately, you can't build rocks into trees. So, you know, some of the fallen trees did have to get moved. They're placed currently. Um, but there's also a big area that is the most picturesque area that wasn't being disturbed in this project. And that's, what's, that's what we're depicting here. Um, so the magenta line is the end of where we're actually placing beach fill, because after we build these groins, we have to actually fill, fill them. And so at the very north end of it, which is station zero, there's still a 100-foot gap between uh, that and the nearest, what would be left in the natural state. So I wanted to kind of bring that up because that was just something that was really concerning the citizens of Longbow Key, and we were getting a lot of calls from it. Next slide. Here's some more images of that exact area that we're talking about. And as a matter of fact, um, we're going to be setting up a meeting with our contractor next week where we're going to go out and actually look at all this, all the material that might need to be removed, and what what could be placed, and what could be staged, you know, and how we won't be in violation of either our permit or our future tilling efforts and everything else. So, you know, beyond these pr this pretty area, we might actually look at potentially creating some more. Next slide. So, in con uh, the construction of segment two, what I wanted to show here through some just images is. What a lot of people don't see is what actually is out there on the behalf of a dredge project and a beach fill project. So on the bottom, Weeks uses these cages, the bottom, the bottom left, which are there. So if there's anything undesirable coming out of that pipe, it gets captured by that. So the, what you end up with is good sand. 
On the top, you have what's called an offloader and a, you know, a barge with a scowl barge. And those scowl barges with the ocean-going tugs that they have, they're up to 600 feet long when they're full, you know, when they're full and in tow. And there's about six to 8,000 cubic yards of sand inside each scour. So the scour barges have to go back and forth up to Passage Key where the Dredge Elfson is, and that's filling those scour barges. They get, they travel up to 16 nautical miles to the offloader where they're pumped to shore. And they're still managing 20,000 yards a day average. You know, so I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty decent number because these guys actually know what they're doing. But most people just see the lower right picture, which is you know, the, sh the shore pipe, the, you know, the, the uh, bulldozers pushing the material around, but they don't see all the other things that are out there. And that's why I think that website is very important because we're showing all that. We're showing all of this, all of this equipment is, on, is here on behalf of the citizens that are paying for this project. So it's, it, to me, that's important. Next slide. What you have here is um, the Gulfside Road dredge area. That's the dredge rock bridge. Um, it's a 16-inch cutter head dredge, and it basically built that entire beach within a couple of weeks. So it did, those guys did a great job. And again, that's the one you would see from the Longbow Pass Bridge. Next slide. And again, this is again, this is just segments five and six. I know this is in, 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 in the southern end of the island, which is definitely within Sarasota County. However, having that nice continuous shoreline will definitely help you in the future for keeping all your beach on site. If you're locking in segments of beach by creating more beach. And so we're looking to begin that in FY22, but like I said, there's an opportunity right now we're exploring with agencies, the contractor, and everybody else in order to try to possibly accelerate that project into this year's cycle. All right, subject to your questions. Any questions? Thank you very much. Great job. All right, moving forward, affordable housing overview. Dr. Hope's coming up, I think. Thank you. I believe this was uh, Chair Kennedy from the school board's request that we add this to the agenda. And I'd like to introduce uh, Denise Thomas and Jennifer Yost, who are both managers in our community development area. Ladies. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Yost. I'm a community development project manager with Manatee County. Um, so uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the housing snapshot and affordable housing um, in Manatee County and what some of our existing affordable housing and programs and incentives are. So if we could please go to the first slide. Um, so when we really talk about um, affordable housing, we wanted to talk about who is affordable housing um, rather than what is affordable housing. So when we look at the starting salaries of most line employees from Manatee County, they make about $48,000 a year. The average wage from Manatee County household is $44,000. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Um, um, th this graph is ordered by the number of employees in each super sector um, uh, or trade um, in our communities. Um, and obviously what stands out, the employees of restaurants and other eating places, the average salary would take almost 70% of their pay to pay fair market rates for a two-bedroom apartment in our communities. Um, and so this is the slide of like what, what percentage of that household's wage would take to pay. Um, and we know we are a tourism and destination communities. Um, and so that stands out specifically. Um, um, the, the middle income of our community is also struggling to be able to afford housing in our extremely low income, um, but it is our middle income, our 80% to 120. The rule of thumb is that you should spend no more than 30% of your gross income on housing costs. And so with a household of four, 76,700 is the um, median income for a household. Um, and to be able to um, pay for a uh, sales price on a house, um, they should be buying at 100%, they should be buying at $252,000 to spend no more than 30% of their income. However, the median sales price in Manatee County right now for a single family home is $345,000. So 
our middle income can't afford the median household um, um, housing costs in our community. If you go to the next, and so now we're looking at the rental uh, industry. So this is the average month rent for a two bedroom apartment, and just the graph itself shows that our rents have been going. Um, in February of 2021, uh, the average rent for a two bedroom apartment is uh, 1,255. Um, again, the average rent being above what most people can afford in Manatee County. Um, to help tell the story is to look at that cost burden. How many people in our community, how many households are spending more than 30% of their income? Um, so renters at zero to 80% of very median income, this is going to be our low income population. Uh, we are showing that over 9,000 households are spending more than half of their income on rent. Of that, those greater than 80%, 352 are spending more than half of their income on rent. Of homeowners, again, we see a very similar statistic. Of homeowners at zero to 80%, 9,000 are spending more than half of their income and uh, just under uh, 1,500 are spent of those at greater incomes are spending. What we're showing is that 52% of renters in Manatee County are cost burden. They're spending more than 30% of their income on uh, rent, and 24.3% of homeowners are spending more than 30% of income, of their um, income, or cost burden, cost burden sorry. Um, so looking at our, we're going to just look at the rent here just as a snapshot. Um, we have approximately 4,700 renter households in the community. Next. And we have uh, 63,000 affordable units. So we actually have more affordable units than we have households, which is great news. This is $15,000 of a uh, 15,000 unit difference, sorry. Uh, next. Um, but that doesn't tell the whole story because these are about what's available in the housing stock. This is supply. This is just inventory. Um, taking that same uh, renters of how many are actually available for low income uh, renters in our community. Go to the next. And then the next. Um, so we actually only have 42,000 affordable units of that 63,000 that are actually available for low income persons leaving us with 5,000 more re low-income renters than they're affordable and available. What this is really showing us is that there is 21,000 households that are making more income that are actually occupying affordable rental units in our community. That's so that we're actually in a deficit of affordable units that are available for low-income households. So we're going to talk a little bit about our current programs and incentives. Um, and Denise Thomas is going to talk about our surplus property program. Good afternoon, Denise Thomas, Community Development Division Manager for the Redevelopment Economic Opportunity Department. My primary role is to work with affordable housing. I am the state ship uh, administrator from the step, ship funds we receive from the state and also working with the community development block grant and home funds. When we look at Manatee County affordable housing programs and initiatives, go to the first slide. I also work with the county with regards to surplus properties and the county when we are notified of a surplus property, we do go out and look at that site to see if it would be a buildable site for affordable housing. Many times it may be a, just a slither of a site that is not for buildability. We also look at the ingress and egress. We look at the neighborhood character because in the conveyance of the property, we want the end result to have an affordable house built upon it. We also look at the surrounding the schools and so forth because most affordable housing need to be close to schools, need to be close to transportation, close to grocery stores and activity centers for most of the individuals that we serve. We also get with our planning department to look at the zoning requirements to ensure that once we convey the site that it can end up with the end result of a home being built on it. Next slide please. With regard to REO surplus property for affordable housing, 
I am authorized under ordinance number 0530 to convey to nonprofit developers who are interested in building affordable housing. They can either build it to resale to a low or moderate income household, or they can hold on to it as a rental unit. I can say for the most part, most of our nonprofits who come forward, even though they want to do affordable housing, they're only able to do one or two units at a time. And they also need seed money such as federal funds to do the vertical bill. So that limits as much as what they can do in bringing out affordable housing within our community, even though the need is still great. So looking for large parcel sites is very difficult. There are not many available, and if they are available, they may have some zoning requirements, which is which can bring on assess a cost, or they may have other issues with the site that they have to work through. But we try to work with our partner developers that do come into the area, identify a site that's not surplus, and try to get through that process so we can get the end result of affordable housing, especially with multifamily. One of the programs the county gave our department a charge to talk with developers and see what is the greatest hindrance or challenge that they have in bringing on affordable housing. Please keep in mind, to bring on affordable housing, a developer has to look at the feasibility of the project and whether they will be able to build it at a lower cost to serve the individuals that we're trying to serve. And in looking at that, one of the things that most of our developers said was a barrier for them was impact fees. So we were given a charge to look at a program that we could possibly bring before the board to see how we can help in that development process. And we were able to come up with the design of a program called Livable Manatee that will pay 100% of county impact fees, school impact fees, and water and facility impact fees for a development for those affordable units. And we call the program Livable Manatee. Our board sanctioned it. They actually provided uh, avenue of funds through general revenue funds in order for us to administer this program. So we did design business terms that we will provide for a single family development or even a rental development, a maximum of 500,000 but they had to at least do 25% or more affordable units within that development to offset the cost. When we opened that program, we had developers come from all directions. That was really the nugget that was needed to entice them to come into Manatee County because Manatee County had little to no development going on. So with this program, we were able to um, incentivize developers to come into Manatee County to look toward leveraging other state funds in order to bring on affordable housing, such as tax credit funds or sale funding, which basically our portion become just a small component toward bringing over $25 million within Manatee County or $10 million into Manatee County to bring on various size developments. Livable Manatee worked. It, en it encouraged developments. We have probably about six developments that are in one stage of the process. We have just completed uh, one project, which is Oaks at Lakeside, that not only housed Section 8 tenants, but elderly tenants, low income, and different level, up to 60% area medium income within their development. We also encourage developers to do mixed income developments where they have a set aside of so many that may serve 80% and below, but they also can make those units available to moderate income households and higher. Because when it's a mixed income development, it can thrive better, it can operate better, and it becomes a well-structured community. And that's what we try to encourage through our programs and our partnerships with our developers. Next slide, please. With the SHIP program, uh, many of you may know of it. It is a trust fund that comes from documentary stamps for every purchase that occur in Florida. Florida is the only state that have the State Housing Initiative Partnership Program, which is called SHIP for short. It is provided through legislative appropriation of funding to local governments in order to
to encourage housing. Through this program, we do housing rehabilitation. And when I say housing re rehabilitation, we're talking about substantial rehab. Our rehabs amount to close to 70,000 because we have age housing stock within Manatee County. Many times when we go in, we're looking for code related repairs and it is roof windows, plumbing, roof, and a lot of needs within these communities to put them in a safe and decent housing. We're not trying to put a Band-Aid on a massive wound. We're trying to create a livable environment for our citizens. And if it's beyond rehab, and we have quite a few, that even if we did the rehab, it still will have issues with it. We work with the homeowner to demolish the home and rebuild a new one. And they are able to get a safe and decent house that will last for years. A lot of our clients that we serve are elderly because they have, don't have the means to do it and the family is not supporting them in being able to get into safe and decent housing. So we, whenever we open up the program, we have a substantial number of individuals that are elderly and disabled that come forward for the program, as well as our general public, and we only serve households at 80% and below. We also have a down payment assistance program that just opened up, and we didn't have SHIP allocation, but we were able to use our federal funds for it. But what it does is provide a down payment assistance to individuals who want to purchase a home. And as you heard, the price of homes are increasing. So we're in a process of trying to increase our sales price level as well as increase our level of assistance. But with the amount of down payment we provide, and, and let me just pause here to tell you, my prior background is I was a regional underwriter. I used to approve home loans for individuals. And with that one thing with a lender, the more down payment you put into the property, the less is the risk for that lender. So the levels that we provide in our down payment assistance program for individuals that are low income, they become less of a risk. They have met the credit needs, but they have less of a risk, which means the lender's exposure is 80% or below. And on the normal terms, usually, they would probably put 3% down or 5% down and the rest would be financed. We're able to lower that first mortgage for them to make it affordable. And even in the times of recession, we had very little foreclosure because they still could afford the payment that they were getting. And many times the mortgage payment is less than the rent payment they were paying prior to home ownership. So this is also allowing them to invest in their community and also to strengthen their community and be a part of their community. We also have the strategy of disaster assistance that if we are declared a national emergency, we can divert funds as we have had with hurricanes coming through. We can divert uncommitted funds toward addressing those needs for individuals who are in that dire situation due to um, the emergency that has occurred. And we also try to provoke, provide a portion of our SHIP funds toward rental development to help spur on bringing on additional housing units for our renting population. We are also recipients, the next slide, to HUD funding, which is our home funding and our community development block grant, which we call CDBG, and our home investment partnership. Our current strategies is affordable housing development with home ownership and rental, uh, homeowner rehab, and also the homeowner down payment assistance. This year we received a little over 600,000 from the home program. And under the CDBG program, we receive about 1.9 million. And those funds have helped us with our down payment assistance program when the state did not provide any funding, our homeowner rehab, uh, infrastructure improvements for affordable housing. We can also provide, we have to provide a portion of it to public service, which is those nonprofits that provide services within the community to our elderly and to those who are in need. We also can provide funds to our public facilities and infrastructure for non-housing, which is parks, uh, roads, lighting. If many of you know, we have a park going up in Washington Park, and we were able to devote some funds toward the development of that park. So it's all about strengthening 
low-income communities, giving them some hope within the community that they are part of, bringing on housing, which is ownership, which creates pride within that individual. We are trying to address all housing needs, and our spectrum go from homeless to the moderate income. But believe it or not, all of them need help. All of them need housing in some form or some fashion, or they have some other need that they need us to help bring within that community to make their community more stronger for them. So for the most part, um, with the programs that we do administer, we work very closely with the applicants and constituents of Manatee County. We try to provide the best service we can, but even with the funding that I just mentioned, it's still not enough. There are still individuals we can't help because the funds run out before we can serve them. So whether you realize it or not, and our funds for SHIP cross over in the city of Palmetto as well as uh, all over Manatee County, but the challenge we have and what we see, and as you saw, the crisis of rising costs, we are having challenges in meeting the needs of the community because the funds are not there to the level that we need them to be there. Thank you, that's all I have, unless you have any questions. Any questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on, we'll have public comment. Um, I guess if you, uh, any public come up and please just state your name and you'll have three minutes. Hey, my name is Rod Griffin. I'm a lifelong resident of Manatee County. Um, I want to speak to the boat ramp issue. Um, I worked over 30 years in government right here in this town. And if there's anything I learned from that is projects in government take forever. They just do. You have once a month meetings, twice a month meetings, things drag on forever. Then when you try to get multiple government agencies to work together on a project, that slows it down even more. So the pipe dream of a Skyway boat ramp is the pinnacle. That's, that's where we need to end up. But to think that's going to happen in the next 10 years is probably not accurate. Um, you know, you get a lot of promises from government. The Manatee County Commission, sitting as the Port Authority, 20-plus years ago, promised us a boat ramp at Piney Point. They went in, they bought the property, they said, as long as we get to do this expansion of berth 13 and 14, we'll build a nice boat ramp at Piney Point for the community. They snatched it out from under us and never did it. Now they're saying they don't want to use that property because now they want to expand in that direction. So, you know, you get a lot, of, a lot of promises, but you don't get a lot of mileage out of these promises. Right now, the city of Palmetto, something that wasn't discussed during your boat ramp stuff, they have a beautiful boat ramp with only 18 paved parking spaces but they own the land right across the street that can house about 150 trucks and trailers. They're in the process of trying to sell this particular piece of property to build high rises. So if you want an immediate uh, tourniquet to stop the bleeding of this problem, if we could get the county or whoever, whether it's WCIND money or county tax money to either partner with the city or purchase this land from the city, and put in some really nice parking there. You can park upwards of 150 trucks and trailers right there, and the county needs that a lot worse than they need another high rise on the water. So I don't know how these groups come together, but to try to make your constituents wait another 10 or 15 years on a boat ramp that'll probably never happen, I think the immediate solution is let Manatee County get with the city of Palmetto and try to work out something to maintain that vacant property right there at our boat ramp, and that could uh, kind of ease the pressure for a long time for us. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Ryan Bustle. I'd like to kind of echo Rod Griffin's comments. Uh, I remember how excited I was to hear about the project at the Skyway and what uh, uh, boom that would be for voters, uh, and that was uh, probably 10 years ago. Of course, we're, we're still at the same place when it comes to the Skyway. 
Well, listen, all of us would love to see that, but um, we have some immediate needs that need to be addressed in the North River area. And I'm asking the county and the city to please come together and, and make this work because uh, 18 parking spaces for about 100 boats that show up on a, any given weekend is a, a recipe for disaster. And we need a fix in the short term. And I ask, please, these two entities who I think can work together very well to solve this problem, please get it done for the citizens in, in the North River area. Thank you. Thank you. I have handouts for a lot of people. I don't know if you want me to do them now or what, or afterwards. Afterwards. Hi, my name is Elaine Johnson. 24 years ago, my family moved to Palmetto, primarily due to the vast waterfront it had to offer. We are outdoor enthusiasts and love our family time spent on the water. March 26, I became aware of the sale of the property adjacent to the Palmetto boat ramp with plans to construct high density apartments or condominiums with retail, thereby cutting off parking access to up to 90 boaters each weekend day. There are currently only 18 permanent spots. This truly broke my heart, knowing how many families and businesses this would negatively affect. We now have a full-fledged campaign to save this parking, as I'm sure most of you are aware by now. I was recently contacted by Brian Gorski, the Executive Director of Manatee Chapter of the CCA, which is the Coastal Conservation Association. They are in full support of our campaign to stop this development. CCA represents 20,000 recreational anglers in Florida and over 1,000 in Manatee County. Manatee County is the largest chapter in Florida. In the last three years, CCA has released over 4,000 redfish in Manatee County, contributed 25,000 to the Larry Borden Reef, which equates to 200,000 pounds of limestone boulders that paid for and deployed 175 tons of concrete culverts to the New Bridge Reef five miles off of Anna Maria Island and sponsored 100,000 claims clams to be deployed in Sarasota, Sarasota Bay. I brought to you today a few of their statistics regarding the impact that recreational anglers have to our economy. That's what I'll be passing out. We have spoken to the city of Palmetto three times. They have talked about plans to move parking somewhere else in the city when they develop the property. This is not a sensible option. It'll add undue traffic congestion compound safety issues and further complicate the launch process. They continue to say most of the boaters using the parking do not live in the city of Palmetto. They are even willing to spend time and money on surveys to prove that. I have a question. If I don't live in the city, should I not shop in the city? Most boaters travel to different ramps for any, for an, any number of reasons. Should we not take that into consideration? Also the economic impact they bring in? I'm here today to request that Manatee County and the City of Palmetto get back on track with their original interlocal plans and complete the project dated January 3rd, 2012 to expand the boat trailer parking onto the lot adjacent to the ramp. According to the meeting minutes, that was a phased project. In the minutes from the January 24th meeting, Mr. Chaffee stated that Palmetto had already purchased the property for this project, which proves their original intentions. This was nine years ago. At what phase did you all lose sight of the original plan? My daughter Mallory will refer her time to me if that's okay. Is that all right? Can that, Mr. To Attorney? To defer time? That is not something that... No, it's... it's you don't allow that? And talk right there. Okay. No, we do not. Are you going to let me finish or am I done? No, time is up. So if okay. you want to have her come up, that's fine. And she can finish. Her you want to finish it? <laughs> Bob, do you want to finish it for me? Um, Come on, Bob. <laughs> anyone else? Please state your name. You have three Just minutes. Start right here. Okay. Thank you, guys. My name is Bob Gill. I live in Palmetto. Um, I run the Manatee County Fishing Network. On Facebook, we have uh, close to 6,000 members in our group. Let me uh, finish this for Elaine. With over 21,000 registered boats in Manatee County, 
We need to get this project back on the books. We need to consider the citizens and the taxpayers that live here that contribute to the increment of our community that do not want to lose their boat ramp. These, that's all the, the only ramp in Palmetto that we have to launch at. It's the only place my kids will have to launch at in Palmetto. Um, I don't want to see it go away. It doesn't need to go away. We don't need another high rise. Um, I'm sorry, but the uh, this is something our our community needs. This is this whole community of Manatee County was created on fishing and being able to enjoy the waters and stuff. And without access to get to the waters, what are we supposed to do? Not everybody owns a home on the water that they can put their boat in their backyard. As a matter of fact, the majority of people do not own a home on the water that they can put their boat on, you know, in their backyard. They need these ramps to be able to get out there and experience what Manatee County and this whole Tampa Bay area has to offer and they spend money on their gas in, Man in Palmetto. They spend money on their food and drinks and ice and they support a lot of these businesses as they come to these ramps and, and utilize them. So please consider, you know, getting together with the city of Palmetto and, and working a deal so we can keep this space for us to park our vehicles and stuff, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I hope I can hold this up because I was told at the Palmetto City Hall I couldn't raise it during the meeting. So on the microphone. I brought this sign for everybody to see because this is what's going to happen. Sir, if you could please state your name for the record. My name is Richard Willis Gellett. I am from Ellington. 3311 Elm Street. I live about a mile and a half outside of Palmetto City limits. And um, a couple of things I want to talk about in the three minutes I have is I don't think people realize how many people come to this area to use a Palmetto boat ramp. Um, Highway 62, 301, 75, 64, on and on and on, north, south, they're coming. Um, as my cousin Charlie said last meeting in Duet, when you watch people come, they're coming from Mulberry, Lakeland. They're coming because we have the best place on this West Coast to fish, to have fun, to boat. But if we sell the boat ramp property in Palmetto, this is what y'all going to have in Bradenton. You're going to have 150 to 200 boats coming across the bridge. And I speak for 42 commercial fishermen north of the river who catch mullet. Not everybody fishes out of Cortez, as Kara Whitmore would say. Um, there's a lot of fishermen north of the river. So we don't have a place to put our boat in. We can't make a living. My living is from fishing. Um, I don't have a second job that I can go to like some people here. And there's one more thing I want to say. The Skyway boat ramp, be careful. Because I'm going to tell you what, when that west wind blows and that south wind blows and that northwest wind blows, somebody's going to die out there. I know a handful of people that go out there and fish, including me, Rod, Art Shiver, Ryan, Toe Jam, Stovall. But I'm going to tell you right now, we've done it. We know it. And you put some people that don't know that area, they're going to die. And I don't know if you guys got engineers to study all that, but Tampa Bay is big. It's not like putting in a Longboat Key, coming around, you got plenty of time to judge because there's a bridge there, there's a point there. But Tampa Bay is big. I think it's nine miles from that point to Anna Maria. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of water when it builds up, four foot waves, Think about novice boaters coming in there. I'm telling you, that's not that's not a real good idea. 
you might want to ask some experienced charters in the area about that, about the Skyway, how rough it gets. And that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Julie Brown. I'm a lifelong fisherman in Manatee County. I was born and raised here. I actually have the minutes from the um, January um, 3rd, 2012. Can you please step up closer to the microphone? I actually have the minutes from the um, January uh, 3rd, 2012 meeting that was between the County Commission and the City of Palmetto um, regarding that parking area across from the boat ramp where it was going to be purchased for, to add parking spaces where the boaters had parked for many years before that. Um, and then shortly after that in the November or in the January 24th minutes I have with the County Commission, um, they even mentioned that the city had purchased that piece of property that was intended for that. Um, everybody is saying, oh, we'll promise to do this and we'll promise to do that. They've been promising this for years. They've been promising um, making promises that they're not living up to and we have the ability the city has said you need to get with Manatee County see if they can help and we're here to ask for help um, I personally spent from nine o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night Sunday walking around to the citizens of Palmetto and asking them to sign a petition about that particular piece of property and not they do not want it developed the 117 signatures I got, three people that I spoke to over and above that didn't even want to talk to me because they didn't know what I was there for. Um, but I got 117 signatures personally of people who don't want to see that high rise and want it kept for the boat ramp parking. So we're asking you to please come together with the city and, and keep this for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Seth, is there any phone calls? Yes, sir, we do have one. 605, 605, star six, please. Andrew Griffin, Manatee County. Um, so I'm really glad when you guys come together. It, um, I just like it. I get to see a whole different side of the government, so it's really neat. Um, with Piney Point, um, that we were discussing, and I know people are concerned about the deep well, as I was myself, but I believe that at one of our meetings or updates or whatever, we were um, advised that the uh, water is being cleaned before it goes down the well, and I just wanted to confirm that that is true. Um, also, uh, with the science, and, and I've been an advocate um, at the county as well as the school board, uh, related to science on a completely different matter. It was related to the COVID and the coronavirus. But it was a perfect example when Charlie Hunsinger brought up the models of the scientists. They did nothing wrong. You know, they're trying to plan and trying to figure things out. But those are assumptions. They're assumptions. And we have got to understand that science is good, but it assumes an awful lot. And then when you see the actual and how much different the actual cause was. We've got to start thinking science tells us everything. It's 100% accurate. It's not. Um, I'm very concerned about the city of Palmetto property. Um, I did not know anything about it until these uh, citizens uh, have come up. And uh, that's a little concerning. So my, my question is, who authorized purchasing this property in 2012? Um, was it approved or it, does the county have any part in it, you know, because it is the city of Palmetto? And why are, why would we be selling a property that is so beneficial to the residents? I mean, it was the taxpayer's money that purchased it. And it's very concerning when I'm hearing them having to fight with their government to keep a property they've already purchased. So I'm very concerned about that. And I, my final comment is votes matter. Votes matter a lot. And we are seeing that we need to be smarter and we have to start waking up. And we start, need to start vetting these people that we're putting in office, people. So with that, I am going to close. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No, sir. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Um, moving on to, is there any other comments by anyone here on the board? Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Cruz? Are these general or specific to the last? Well, to general, the, com the public comments. General comments. All right, because I, I have two then. Um, I'll, I'll start out just on the, the boat thing, and then I want to get back into the affordable housing because that really wasn't, you know, Denise put together a great presentation. That really wasn't the intent of the discussion, so I just want to touch base on that. Uh, but, but on the boat thing, you know, I completely hear what you're saying. It, it's true. We don't have capacity for boats. I, I was one of the people pushing back when our previous board decided to shut down boat ramps uh, last year, and I pushed back on the, the right-of-way parking at Fort Hamner when they were trying to block that off because we do need more boating. We're a boating community. We're a waterfront community. But we don't have capacity for anything around here. We have a, a massive growth problem, and there's what we do have is a, a limited amount of time and a limited amount of funds and we're trying to monitor everything at once. That's why we have schools that are over 100% capacity when you talk to school board people. It's why we're chasing pickleball courts all over this town when you talk to, to Charlie and, and Parks. We're under capacity everything. That's why we're, we're working endlessly to get a, a library out east because we're under capacity in libraries. So boating and boat slips and boat parking for boat slips is no exception to the rule. We, we acknowledge that. And that's why we had a presentation here today was to try to find other locations to facilitate additional capacity for what we all agree is a need for Manatee County. There's a lot of ways to achieve that. One is, is new boat ramps, one is additional parking existing boat ramps, which we're also trying to work on by putting more parking at Fort Hammer. So, you know, we're looking at all of our options. The one in Palmetto clearly is one. Uh, you know, to, to blindly say, don't sell three and a half acres of land uh, just to, to create parking, I think requires a little more discussion and thought. And in the city of Palmetto, it's, it's not us per se. We're kind of being looped in because there's an opportunity in, for the county to purchase CRA land from Palmetto to facilitate a city of Palmetto boat ramp. So we fall in as the deep pockets more so than the, the, the person and, and, or organization and taxpayers responsible for it because you have to look at all the different aspects here there was this conversation here about everyone from duet and from lakeland and from you know taking 75 and 275 all coming down to the city of palmetto and people from ellington saying i i need to go to the city of palmetto it's the city of palmetto people paying for <laughs> we're going to receive the benefits of selling this land so really what the discussion is is so many people from outside of the city of palmetto would love to use city of palmetto land that the city of palmetto residents should refuse what sounds to be, what, four to five million dollars, three to four million dollars worth of purchase price, another three million dollars worth of impact fees that go across that district, plus the, the, the tax associated with it, plus the people moving there who are then going to shop at the businesses that are inevitably going to come downtown to, to help cater to the 200 plus people as a gateway to Palmetto. Now, I'm not just saying that that's the way you go, but there's a lot more to it than just saying, please don't take in parcel of land because we were using it previously. You got to look at the, the bigger picture here. And we're trying to do that. We're trying to acknowledge this is a problem by looking at alternative solutions. And I get the Skyway may have come up before, but it sounds like, you know, just like we did with Piney Point this year, again, as people keep saying, a day late and a dollar short. I think we're all kind of seeing this is the press, this is the point in time we need to to have action on this. And, and I think you've got a group of people from Palmetto, from City of Bradenton, from Manatee County who are going to work on that. But just to put all of our eggs in one basket and say, this is where it has to be, there's no other option, is, is a little short-sighted and not looking at the bigger picture. That's just my opinion. We don't have a direct stake in that. I'm just, you know, I, I did talk to City of Palmetto about it previously. and. I think there are other options than, than passing that up. Um, relative to affordable housing, because that was kind of the nature, when, when uh, Charlie emailed out wanting to get this on the, the agenda, the discussion had more to do with how do we as a collective group from various municipalities and school board and the county work together to facilitate much needed affordable housing workforce house in Manatee County. Uh, the presentation was great, but we didn't really get into the, the meat of what the request was, was how do we work together? Because what we have right now is different groups charging different impact fees with different levels of needs, with different zoning. 
and, and how do we work together to encourage this affordable housing? So, you know, there, there are a lot of things we can do. I think, you know, a, a good idea would maybe be to look into some form of a, of a task force of sorts that incorporates different groups here to, to kind of work together. Because what I see as the biggest problem is having too many different factions is just is confusing and doesn't get anywhere. We have different zoning across different lines when it comes to different incentives, different impact fees. Some of us buy our impact fees off for developers, other people don't. So, you know, we need to be looking at universal incentives because if you're building on one side of the road or the other, it shouldn't matter because your, te your kid's teacher may live in the city of Bradenton, but your school may be an unincorporated or vice versa. It, it's trying to get the proper housing and the workforce in regardless of, of what boundary it crosses. We need to be looking at impact fees and all kind of coming to some consensus that, you know, we're either all going to waive impact fees or not waive them at all because still having $6,000 impact fees is inevitably not going to make that fully, you know, affordable. We need to be looking at working with our city of Bradenton and city of Palmetto. We have urban core areas and seeing what can the county do and what can the school board do to, to facilitate a discussion on, on additional density to allow for the housing in places where people can walk and, you know, bike to, to work and to, to services. We need to be looking at joint efforts when it comes to maybe us with the school board specific to housing for teachers. A lot of places do that where the school board chips in and the housing is a percentage of it set aside for teachers or with the cities and, you know, about you know, housing for police and EMS and fire and a portion of them go that way. There's a lot of things we can work on here, but it's not just a city or, or Manatee County. I think we need to have a, a meaningful discussion how we can all work together to, to achieve this. And that was kind of the intention of what this agenda item was for. So I'll just leave it at that. Mr. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, Commissioner Cruz said it very well. I'm going to take my mask off for this. Um, Commissioner Cruz said it perfectly, and that was kind of the intention. Um, but I do appreciate this getting put on to here. And for Denise's presentation, I know you all at the county are probably affordable housing it out um, after the past uh, six weeks or so. But but this is a um, uh, this is a dramatic need. Urban Land Land Institute just a month ago said we are the 14th least affordable uh, statistical metro area: uh, Bradenton, Sarasota, Northport. Um, so not only do we have people who can't get their boat in the water, but we have a much larger group of people who can't even find an affordable home to live in. So um, Commissioner Cruz is exactly right. I, we, I don't know if it's a Council of Governments subcommittee, and who wants to volunteer for that? I'll be happy to. But um, we do need to find a way to work across boundaries and within across uh, departments for the school board. And we've had a couple discussions about this already um, and our impact fee study is underway currently but really the way the school board can pitch in is a reduction of school impact fees as George said is about sixty three hundred dollars for any size single-family home um, and then we can also look at um, properties that the school board owns but we are really not using or um, they it's a small piece that is not suitable for a school campus um, but yeah, but thank you, Commissioner Cruz, for saying that because that this is really um, this is I, I hope for Council of Governments needs to be an ongoing uh, an ongoing conversation into how we can all what can we all do in our silos to get out of our silos and coordinate our efforts because um, I don't I don't want to be dramatic but this is um, this is um, this is a significant issue for low and middle income people in this county and really if you think about the economic benefit if you free up um, if a person is spending 50% or more on housing, and if you free up a lot of that disposable income, that's money that's going to be spent within our local economy instead of going to their to their housing costs. So, um, that's I know it's been a long day, so I'll, I, <laughs> that's all I have for now. But but I do hope we can continue to come back to this issue um, across agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Commissioner Ball. Um, yeah, I I like hearing from my. Uh, my fellow commissioners and school board member, I will tell you that uh, I'm the one that sent the email asking that this be put on the agenda for today because I know with uh, all of the uh, municipalities being present and, and some of our law enforcement and so forth, that this is an issue that affects all of us in Manatee County. And it is an issue that is going to have to be tackled by all municipalities in Manatee County and I know that the city of Bradenton does quite a bit and, and I know that and Manatee County is looking at even doing more but 
my thought process was, and I think Charlie Kennedy as well and George, was that if we could all get together and really get into some in-depth conversation about affordable housing, that we might all come up with some ideas that we haven't individually thought of. And because it is a big issue for our residents. And uh, I'm not taking away from boat ramps, don't get me wrong, because I agree with you. But uh, at the same time, we need to make sure that our citizens can afford to live in Manatee County. So um, this is an issue that I hope that the Council of Governments will want to uh, perhaps uh, work together closely on, um, you know, and, and, and come together to try and find some solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Bryant? You know, I, I, I really think it's a good idea. A lot of times when there's pending issues that, you know, we're uh, – you know, we're trying to address that as we move forward, that it's automatic that we have this same issue on the next agenda so that, that we keep the ball rolling and keep the discussion going. So it, you know, might be standing for a while. I, I just like to make that recommendation. I think that's a great recommendation, uh, Mayor, and I appreciate it very much. And uh, if we need a motion to do that, I'll be happy to make that motion right now. I don't know if we can do that, but can we do that, Mr. County Attorney? I can't no. hear you. Sorry. Sorry. No, we're not really noticed yeah, to be a body that takes action. That's but what it's I certainly figured, something but that the county is sort of the host agency for scheduling these things, so we can certainly accommodate that. Okay. If Dr. Hopes is okay with that. It's really his. Yeah, and uh, I, I think that that's something that we'll up, so. make sure gets put on the agenda next time. Thank you, Mayor. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I'd like to say thank you for, again, for getting the, the voting issue on the agenda. So I know you were part of that as well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I just want to say thank you, Commissioner Cruz. I think you said everything perfect. I think that um, we have to consider the things that he's said. Um, I've sat here for several years now, and I think that over the years, we've seen things that I think it was 18 years ago or so that we in the city of Palmetto, our ordinance uh, for the builders said that they had to provide 10% of their development, uh, housing development, uh, for um, the type of housing that we're discussing now. So affordable workplace and so forth. But that seems to have fallen by the wayside. Maybe we need to go back to it. Um, and all communities and county do that. But... Um, you know, it's, again, the builders have the desire to build out, and we can't, you know, we, we require them to do a certain amount of the infrastructure, but it's the infrastructure between where their development is and the rest of the communities that is suffering. Um, so that's where I think we're really falling short. Um, you develop out, I don't know how many home permits or development you've got scheduled right now totally in the county, but... If it's 50,000 more homes, which I think it's far north of that, but if it's that many, how many of them are going to be voters? We better get going on ramps, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else before I close out? All right. Now, I just have a final comment for me before I announce the next meeting, but um, I guess somewhere close to 29 years ago, the city of Bradenton had an employee start that uh, – it was part time and then went full time for the last 26 years, and and um, he's retiring June 30th. So I know that he's been in a, with a lot of people in this room over the years. But I just want to thank Carl Callahan for what he's done for our city and county. So, <laughs> so and it means to get to play more golf, maybe, or have more fun and not deal with all the drama of government. But anyway. Um, the announcement is the next Council of Government meeting is scheduled for August 3rd, 2021 at 4 p.m. in this same room, and the meeting will be hosted by the City of Braden and Beach, Mayor John Chappie as the chair. So. And uh, affordable housing will be on the agenda. So, no, thank you. And, 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 yeah, beachy theme. But, no, and I just want to once again, um, as my involvement over the last eight-plus years now, great meeting. Great topics, and we appreciate the citizens coming forward. And a lot of things that, uh, you know, you think sometimes government doesn't listen. We do listen, and we're there for our citizens because we are those citizens as well. So thank you for you all being here, and I appreciate it. And a great meeting. It will be adjourned. <laughs>
Nowadays, we tend to shop around for the cheapest, lowest prices. One way people think they can save a lot of money is by hiring unlicensed contractors. But keep in mind, that low price can be filled with lots of problems. There can be all kinds of problems just from poor quality to uh, just to be having a, a structure that really isn't even uh, approved and hard to get insurance, hard to get financed. Uh, if there's an issue, who's going to take care of it for you? Who's going to cover it for you? Do they have liability insurance? Chances are they don't have liability insurance because an uh, insurance company is not going to insure somebody who's not properly licensed uh, to do that work. And what happens when there's an accident? Uh, what happens if the work they've done causes damage to the home? There are so many different issues that can happen when you have an unlicensed person. These licensed guys, they know what it takes to do that. They know what's required. They call us to go inspect it. We go check it. If the breaker is not correct, they make sure and correct that. CJ Dupre is a building official with Manatee County. He ensures that all licensed contractors are building according to the strict building codes. He has never once been called by an unlicensed contractor to inspect their work, but is very familiar with the final products. I've seen a young couple buy a house that was uh, remodeled uh, by a contractor that the interior wall collapsed because he took out a load-bearing wall. That wouldn't have happened if they would have had somebody that was licensed and it was properly inspected to comply with code. Uh, also the life safety issues for uh, non-conforming work that may cause uh, uh, a fire, uh, collapsing of structures. Licensed contractors every two years have to take continuing education. They're up to date on all new building code revisions and adoptions. Well, there's, there's codes that we follow to make sure that, that the, the life and safety of the homeowners are, are kept in mind, that, that everybody's protected, that there's no, no damage to the property would occur, um, and, and making sure that you know, the liability always falls on, on my shoulders. Even though unlicensed contracting doesn't follow codes and holds homeowners liable, is it really breaking any laws? It is technically a misdemeanor to do unlicensed contracting. Most of the times we do hand out citations if they are caught a second time, it is a felony in the third degree, and they can be processed through the state attorney's office. Facing fines up to $5,000 and the possibility of being arrested, but unlicensed contractors can also hold you liable. You can be fined and taken to court for aiding and abetting unlicensed activity if you decide to hire one of these individuals. Unfortunately, Manatee County we cannot assist you in any fraud that you may have come across with hiring one of these people. A contract between an unlicensed individual and an owner is null and void. There's nothing I can do to help you. But before a contract is even written, here are ways to find out if the contractor you're hiring is licensed. Some of the tall tale scientists, they pull up in their truck and has, it doesn't have a state license on it. A state license will start with three letters and a series of numbers. A county license will start with two letters and a series of numbers. And if they hand you a contract that is hand scratched on a piece of paper, if it does not have their license number on those documents or their business cards, chances are they're not licensed. Before you hire a contractor, if uh, you're not sure, call us. Call us, email us, doesn't cost you anything. We'll check to make sure that that person that you're getting ready to let in your house and start tearing, tearing walls down is properly licensed and insured to work in your home. To check on a contractor before you hire them, call Manatee County at 748-4501, extension 3800. Or to verify a state license or report unlicensed activity, visit www.myfloridalicense.com. off the beautiful sun coast of Manatee County, both residents and tourists could agree that just about any day is a perfect day for the beach. And while the water may look inviting, it's important to know that there can be dangers below the surface. 
95% of Manatee County's water rescues are related to rip currents. When you're caught in a rip current, if you're not saved by a lifeguard or saved by somebody else, statistics show that uh, it usually ends in a tragedy. Florida ranks number one for rip current depths, and rip currents can happen anywhere. They're extremely common. Um, we have them on our beaches many days of the year. Most, most misconceptions about rip currents is that they're wide and they're huge. Most of them aren't. Most of them are 10 yards wide to 20 yards wide and that's it. And then they're 50 yards long. You'll feel a rip current as it pulls you offshore. You'll feel it pick up speed as it's closer to shore, the strength. As it goes further away from shore, you'll feel that rip current start to weaken. And all of a sudden you'll, you'll see yourself to where you're not, you're not traversing further away from the shoreline. At that point, it's safe not to swim back into the rip current, but swim either at a 45 degree angle or a 90 degree angle parallel to the beach, 15, 20 yards, and then swim in. Never try to fight that rip current back to shore. When you do, you're swimming against a current that is five to 10 knots. It's hard for anyone to keep up any kind of a swimming capability against that current. But before you even enter the water, here are some things you can look out for on your local beach. Always swim on a lifeguarded beach. We have lifeguards at Manatee Beach as well as Coquina Beach. It's important for safety. It's important for the fact that, that there's someone that sits in that tower every day and knows the conditions that exist. There's someone there that can help you with directions. There's someone there that can help you with first aid. Uh, all of our staff are trained EMTs. We're all rescue divers. On each and every tower, we have a flag flying every day. And uh, there is a chart that is posted on the base of each tower so that they can come up and reference that to know the conditions of the day. Know your ability, know how strong of a swimmer you might be, know the water conditions, make sure you're aware of what the conditions are of the day, and take a good look at the surf. If the surf is rough, there are gonna be rip currents. If it's a calm, flat day, chances are there are no rip currents. So remember, when you're visiting Manatee County's beautiful beaches, always swim near lifeguarded station. And parents should always be nearby when children are in the water. For more information on how to keep you and your family safe while visiting the beach, log on to mymanatee.org slash beach safety. And to find out about current beach conditions, including if there's rip currents at your beach, go to colgate.mode.org slash beach conditions. County has, has been on the map for a while, but being the 25th county in the state of Florida, which is a Purple Heart state, we wanted to do something a little bit different. Our very first combat wounded Purple Heart parking site. Today we've actually marked a formal way of saying thank you to those veterans who have been awarded the Purple Heart. We're going to have 53 of these signs at all the parks, constitutional offices, libraries, and the public accessible buildings. I mean, it's going to be there every single day that a person walks through that door is reminded of all these sacrifices the men and women have had. There's, there's very little roof error between a Purple Heart who can walk recipient who can walk away and one who doesn't. And I know many who have not had the chance to walk away. So I'm very, very glad to see it. This is quite a compliment to recognize us for the, the things we did. And a big thank you goes out for me to the county for doing this. It shows that the county has not forgotten its veterans. I mean, this really drives at home how dedicated we are to take care of our veterans and their families. Is anyone coming through the county to do business, going into the libraries or spending time at the parks, 
they really realize why they have the freedoms that they do. It's because of the support recipients and the sacrifices that they've made while we have those. When an emergency happens, we count on our paramedics to be there. We rely on them to provide us with the immediate pre-hospital care we need, and they rely on us to find out what's wrong. Today, Manatee County paramedics are responding to more 911 calls than ever before, and what they're finding out is a lot of these calls could have been prevented. As a paramedic, I respond to 911 calls and I realized that I could be doing so much more for these patients and I was actually not doing the right thing by just picking them up and taking them to the hospital for them to get lost in the healthcare maze. And as I continued to realize this, I started looking at neighboring agencies and successful community paramedic programs throughout the nation and I was asking myself, well how come we're not doing this here when the need is so great? James Crutchfield has taken the lead in developing Manatee County's new community paramedic program. Working alongside two other seasoned paramedics, the program will begin by targeting five subtypes of patients. Frequent falls, mental health and substance abuse, diabetic patients, congestive heart failure and chronic respiratory conditions, and high system utilizers. The ideal of the program is to respond, reduce, and redirect patients to the most appropriate resource at the right time, at the right cost. Sometimes there's a little bit of a, a gap between uh, the time that the patient leaves a facility, a hospital, or a treatment facility. And so what we're able to do is we're able to, to kind of um, help be like an extension of the physicians in the healthcare industry uh, and be able to you know, get their services to their patient and get the patient to the resources that they need. Patients are referred in multiple ways. Um, they can be referred by ambulance crews, they can be referred by physicians, case managers, home health. The referral process comes into our chief and he then determines if they're a candidate for the program. After a patient is referred to the program, these highly trained paramedics will go into their home, sit down, and talk with them to find out where their needs are not being met. They take a look at the bigger picture and come up with a plan tailored to each patient. Then, by working alongside various community partners, they are able to connect patients with the resources they truly need. The School of Pharmacy has partnered with the paramedicine program because there have been some gaps in care that have been identified with the medically underserved patients of Manatee County. So we are collaborating to try to help identify some of the barriers of care that are out there for our patients and see from a medication aspect what we can do to help resolve some of those problems for our patients. County employees and Centerstone employees get to work together in the field to uh, try to talk people into starting their journey to recovery. And that's a bit different than before. And so I think that what will happen over time is that we'll all have a better understanding of what's going on in the community and we'll be more flexible and more quick to respond. There's so many people involved because it's a community issue. It's not just one uh, group of people. But um, as a community, we've kind of developed this problem, and as a community, we're going to fix it. This community partnership allows the medics to do more for their patients than just tell them about the resources they were unaware of. It brings the resources right to their front door, which in the long run does more than just fix the patient's problems. It changes their lives. Anybody that uses this program will get the support that they need because it exceeded all my expectations of anything. They're, they're so good. I, I thank God for them every day because they have helped me. My hopes for this program is to be the link that's missing in the healthcare industry. We've got such an abundance of patients with individualized 
medical needs. The majority of the patients that I've seen so far um, had no idea that um, these resources existed. They didn't know that there were resources available for dur durable medical equipment. They didn't realize that there were resources available for transportation. They didn't realize there were resources available for the NA and the AA meetings and what the times were. As the program continues to develop, uh, we're going to see um, a healthier community. When emergencies happen, we count on our paramedics to be there. Now, even after an emergency, patients have someone to count on, someone to connect them to the help they truly need. Because Manatee County's community paramedic program is more than just lights and sirens. From the beautiful beaches of Anna Maria Island, to the exquisite nature preserves, from the historic buildings of downtown Bradenton, to the expanding communities of Lakewood Ranch, water is essential to keeping Manatee County a wonderful place to live, play, and work. We all have a shared responsibility to do our part to keep our water safe. Our drinking water is a precious resource that we can sometimes take for granted. Every time we turn on the faucet, we expect clean, safe drinking water. However, there are ways that non-drinking water can enter our drinking water system. And by law, precautions must be taken to prevent this occurrence. Our drinking water comes from two sources, Lake Manatee and groundwater from the Upper Florida Aquifer. It is purified at the Manatee County Water Treatment Plant. A multiple barrier approach is used to ensure the water meets federal and state drinking water standards. The treatment process includes source water protection, optimized particle removal, and appropriate disinfection. After the treated water leaves the plant, it is supplied to homes and businesses under pressure through the county distribution system. When the water passes through the customer's meter, it leaves the county system and becomes part of the customer's private system. After the water passes through the meter, Manatee County can no longer control the quality of water and thus does not want any of the water to flow back into the distribution system. The Manatee County Cross Connection Control Program safeguards the public drinking water supply from unintentional contamination. To preserve safe drinking water in our community, we all have a shared responsibility to prevent backflow of water into the county's water distribution system from our homes and businesses. Backflow is the reversal of flow of water. This happens when water in a homeowner's plumbing flows back into the community water system where it originated. Backflow can occur when either the supply pressure drops or the pressure on the customer side becomes greater than the supply pressure. A cross connection is a connection between a drinking water and a non-drinking water source. For example, between a garden hose and a swimming pool. If a hose outlet is submerged in a pool, you would have created a cross connection. If there was a drop in pressure in the county system, the pool water could backflow or back siphon through the hose, through your house water lines, and into the county distribution system. It's important to protect against backflow because when the flow of water is reversed, harmful substances may enter the drinking water system. When this occurs, water is no longer safe to drink. We are all connected in our community via the workplace, the internet, and social media, but we're also connected in a less obvious way through our drinking water system. If you fail to do your part to protect against cross connections and backflow, others may be seriously affected by your actions. Backflow preventers are required for properties with an in-ground irrigation system, a secondary source of water such as reclaimed water or a well, a swimming pool, properties that are adjacent to a body of water including a river, bay, lake, or pond, has a solar water heating system, has a fire sprinkler system, a commercial or industrial building, multi-story or multi-family residential buildings, or if a cross connection is ever discovered. So these requirements apply to properties developed after 1987 when the Manatee County Cross Connection Control Program took effect. Properties developed prior to 1987 that have these conditions will be required to come up to code when any plumbing modifications are made that require a permit. 
A backflow preventer allows water to flow in one direction to the customer, but not in the opposite direction back into the water supply. The backflow preventer is a key component in stopping unwanted substances from entering the drinking water system. Backflow preventers have to be tested annually to make sure that they are working properly to adequately protect the drinking water system. Since backflow preventers are mechanical devices, they have internal seals, springs, and moving parts that over time are subject to wear and tear. The testing must be completed by a contractor registered with Manatee County. A list of certified contractors can be found online at mymanatee.org under backflow prevention assembly information or upon request using this contact information. If your backflow preventer fails the annual test, the property owner is required to have it repaired or replaced. The owner can refer to the same list of certified contractors for repair or replacement as they did for the testing. We recommend getting at least three quotes before hiring a contractor. The property owner has 30 days to bring the backflow preventer into proper working order to avoid water service interruption. Do not leave hoses submerged in drinking water, such as swimming pool or a bucket of soapy water. Maintain at least two inch gap when using hose to fill the pool or any container. Install hose bib vacuum breakers on all your hose spigots. These vacuum breakers will protect your internal plumbing if there's ever a pressure drop in the county system. If you are installing an irrigation system or making plumbing modifications, be sure to hire a licensed contractor that is familiar with Manti County regulations. Reminder, installation of irrigation system requires protection of drinking water meter with a backflow preventer. Pick up after your pets. Storm water can collect pet waste and back siphon through irrigation sprinkler heads, which can be connected to the county's distribution system. Take caution when using fake rocks to cover the backflow preventer. You can miss visible malfunctions such as a leak. Also when using the fake rocks, be sure to drill holes to allow heat and moisture to escape. Contained heat and moisture corrodes the shutoff handles and test ports, causing them to become difficult to operate. We should all do our part in keeping our drinking water safe and clean for everyone. By being aware of the dangers of cross connections and making sure your backflow preventer is working properly, you will do your part in helping to prevent pollutants and contaminants from entering the drinking water system. Backflow prevention is a shared responsibility, so do your part to keep Manatee County's water safe to preserve our way of life for generations to come. For more information or questions, contact the Manatee County Cross Connection Control Team. DOT on a, an excellent project. This roundabout has turned out better than I could have imagined. They were uh, very open and willing to work with the public. They took public comments a year ahead of time and incorporated some of those designs to actually make this roundabout bigger when they realized the number of 18-wheeler trucks that come through here. And we pack fresh citrus and, and it all leaves our packing house uh, on 18-wheelers. So we have 3,000 18-wheelers came in last year and then they leave, so that's 6,000 trips through this intersection. People were questioning how well this would work. Well, I'm here to tell you it works extremely well. Traffic's flowing well. They're not backed up behind 18-wheelers waiting for enough clear space to get through. I would encourage any community uh, to embrace this and uh, work with DOT and they'll see the benefits that we have seen here. So from a safety standpoint, traffic flow standpoint, this has been a complete success in my opinion.
Good afternoon. We are back for the afternoon session uh, of the May 20th land use meeting. Uh, we're going to start with um, any public comment. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. <laughs> Judging the audience, I don't Future know. agenda items. I do not have any cards. Oops, so, sorry. Seth, yes, any phone calls? One caller, 605, 605, star six, please. You like it like this. Hi, caller, go ahead. County, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, I'm sorry, what is your name, please? I'm going to guess it's Andrew Griffin, Manatee County. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so my, as you know, I do a lot of uh, public um, requests, um, public records requests. And um, I'd like somebody to make some rules related to the phones, uh, primarily with the directors. I don't think it's fair that they're able to use their private phones and not be able to turn over all their documents. All they have to do is say it's private, it's redacted, I can't see it. I think that's wholly unfair, especially since they're on the job um, and they're doing these, they're making these calls, texts and whatnot on the job. So I'd like something brought forth um, this afternoon or in the near future uh, to require all the directors to be using a county phone or uh, not be allowed to claim privacy. Thank you. Is that it? Yes, ma'am. That's all we have. Okay. That's the only call? All right. Well, I'll go ahead and close public comment on future agenda items, and we will move forward um, to the one uh, item that we have um, Ms. County Attorney, would you like to read that into record, please? Okay, this was the one three time certain proposed adoption of resolution R21076, denying application rezone Z2016 for a rezone from A, General <coughs> Agriculture to NCS, Neighbor Commercial Small Zoning District. Um, the County Commission had a public hearing on April 15th. At the conclusion of the public hearing, the board directed that written findings of denial be brought back for the board vote on May 20th at 1.30, and the findings are contained in the attached resolution, and the proposed motion is written on the agenda sheet. Basically. All right. Um, I don't guess so. So basically, we close public comments, so all we have left right. is deliberation vote. Okay. What is the pleasure of the board? I just have the don't everybody speak at once? Yeah. I'm trying to I think they took our... I, I will tell you, I didn't have anything. I gave her my agenda. Yeah. Um, Do you want this? Is Madam Chair. Uh, ask you to read it. Oh, the motion you mean? Well, the actually requested proposed motion on the agenda memo says, I move to adopt resolution R21076 to deny application Z2016, which would deny the rezoning from A, General Agriculture, to NCS, Neighbor Commercial Small Zoning District. And as for the property, it was known as Manti Ranchers, the, the um, triangular shape of property. What's the pleasure of the board? So I'll move. Is there a board? second? I voted against us. <laughs> Wait, are... <laughs> I, I'm going to yeah. for lack of a second. Yeah. Madam Chair? That was y'all's vote. I'll the, make the, the second. The vote was to deny it. Yeah. I'm making the second to your motion. All right. We have a motion uh, <laughs> from Commissioner Cruz, a second from Commissioner Baugh. Um, again, I'm going to open this to public comment before we vote. Anyone what? want to speak? Hit your buttons, please. They are now working. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Seth, this is, uh, is this a quasi? Yeah, Madam Chair. I can't tell. It's quasi judicial. We close the public okay. hearing. All right. So we can't. All right. So no public comment. Commissioner Whitmore. Well, you know, we're all up here. We're all adults. Um, we're professionals. And um, we're here to listen. And if we don't jump in and do stuff, that's okay. Maybe none of us want them. 
make a motion or whatever, or, or maybe, you know, they've changed their mind. I don't know, but, you know, I think that we all should respect every, how everybody handles herself up here. That's all. It just, I just noticed that up here. I, I wasn't going to make the motion or second up. I know how I'm going to vote, but I don't have to do all that. So anyway, and I don't appreciate being ridiculed about it. I mean, we're all adults. That's all I respectfully say. All right. Well, I didn't know we had any really cooling, but at, at whatever. Any other commissioners want to make a comment? Uh, not seeing any, we have a motion to um, to approve by Commissioner Cruz, a second by Commissioner Ball. All in favor, say aye. To yeah. deny, I'm sorry. It's yeah. to adopt a resolution to deny. Right? Yeah, right. It's in the recommendation. So I was correct. Thank you. All in favor of the motion, say aye. I was okay. I'm confused here. The motion that we're making and saying I on is to, to deny, deny what we've Correct. already yes. denied. Correct. No. It's the final action for denial, and it starts the 31 days running if there's any litigation. The statute requires us to do written findings. It's just make so That's why point. after the public hearing, oh, the motion it. direct findings prepare. This is what these are. No. <laughs> Call the question again, Madam Chair, pretty please. We have a motion to approve the resolution. All in favor say aye. 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 Better yet, let's do it this way, since we're, we seem to be so excited this afternoon. Right. The it's a motion to approve. You just said tonight. Yeah. No. Uh, no. The no. Resolution there is a resolution that we have to approve, approve. Right. to deny this. So it is a motion to approve the resolution. Right. Mm -hmm. We know. No, you say aye By the if raise you do not, of not hands. want to do this. All in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Can, can I wait, wait, I'm right in the middle. Okay. That was four. Uh, let me raise your hands again so I can write it down for the clerk, please. It's okay. No, I just got to write it I down because I won't remember everyone. Some. Commissioner Whitmore, I got it. Thank you. All oppose, raise your hands. Three to four. Okay. The motion is approved by Commissioner Cruz, Commissioner Whitmore, Commissioner Satcher, and Commissioner Baugh. So it was a four to three vote. You, is that good, Madam Clerk? Okay. Uh, I do not have any commissioners on the board. Do any commissioners want to make a statement? Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You're saying thank now. you if I make a mistake? No, I did. I said thank I know. you for, yeah. Um, what uh, I just have a question on this one issue because now we can talk about it, Madam uh, Attorney. Correct? Can I ask we a question? Now we're then now we're going to a thirty-one day challenge period. Okay, so and it'd be better can't. not to talk about it. Well, that's exactly what I was going to ask. What's the ne next step for the applicant and us? And you more or less can just file said a lawsuit, it. or they can file another application for an alternative plan for the property. Okay, and I can say my reason for still supporting what I did is because of safety issues. That's my reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's why I was only co reason. confused because that's what we had all said. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Commissioner Satcher. Yeah, I'll just say for anyone, that, that was an interesting vote. Um, <laughs> yes, it was. Because there were different. Anyway, um, but I will say that if you look back, I didn't make a mistake or I wasn't not paying attention. Uh, my vote was uh, different the first time this came through. Um, but given uh, the safety concerns that have been brought up, I went ahead and uh, voted that way. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other comments, so we'll go to... Yes, sir? Oh, we'll go to uh, Commissioner Comments. Commissioner Whitmore, did you have anything? Uh, the only thing I wanted to um, state was um, after Tuesday's meeting, I just want us, um, you know, me personally, I've heard what some commissioners want a work session to be or not be. My purpose of a work session and also being involved with other municipalities is to learn so I can make policy decisions. And I've talked to <coughs> Dr. Hopes in the past, but he's busy right now. But... Uh, and he's been on boards before, and work sessions always get, as John Chappie used to say, cussed and discussed, and then it would come to the regular meeting as a policy. So, you know, when I have work sessions, I want to learn before I decide what I want to do to set policy. 
And if we can't learn about new things and various things coming before us, we aren't going to make good policy. And I used the example the other day, Commissioner Satcher has a great organization, and there was an organization, um, Hope Services, that takes in abused women and, and, and hides them, literally, from the abuser that he hasn't, wasn't aware of. So he learned something that day. So um, I think every work session is beneficial to somebody at some point. So I just hope we keep the work sessions up so that we can learn, so we can make good policy. I um, prefer to hear from the people that actually experienced it and not me, and that's all. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely need to keep work sessions. I'm, I, totally. Yeah, I don't. Did we discuss not having work sessions? We, did we I miss that? We changed the format of them about we did. We did. not. We did. Commissioner Cruz had felt that um, it, we weren't productive because it, this was our work session and not really a public thing where the public's involved because there's a lot of stuff I don't know. So I'm glad. Uh, and, and I'm just hoping that the rest of the commission, um, you know, goes that way for future. That's all. I'm, I'm sorry you entirely misinterpreted what I was saying. No, I didn't. I, uh, the whole room did then. Okay, can we, let's keep things on an even keel here. Is there anything else, Commissioner oh, that Whitmore, that I you was, have? I was asked to bring that forward, okay. so I did. Well, I don't necessarily, anyway. Uh, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, did you have anything, sir? Are we at Commissioner Collins? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are, okay. I think. I, I think. As far as I know. We're certainly making comments. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, mine is short and sweet. I just let everybody know that we set up a free clinic for, a vaccine, for pets for vaccinations. Um, and for microchips and, you know, come get your pet their shots. It's completely free. We set up in my district at GT Bray. And um, I credit the, the quick sellout. It sold out in four hours. Uh, yeah, I it's, I it's free. How do you sell out with something that's free? But it booked. How's that? Yep. It booked up in four hours. Uh, so we're really proud of that. Uh, my picture was used in the advertising, which I'm sure led to the, the quick advanced sellout, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was holding a dog. That might have helped, right? Um, but yeah, it was ended up being a great idea. Sarah Brown and I, we were, you know, a, a little, you know, curious as to how well, how successful it would be um, in four hours. So we were stunned and happy, and we, we might try to extend it an hour. She was going to talk to the vets and see if we can accommodate a few more. Uh, Commissioner Servia is doing one in her district as well, and there also will be one at Animal Services in Palmetto. Um, so expect, you know, expect a big sell, you know, everybody to show up. That's for sure. It'll book up. And... Uh, Commissioner Bellamy, there'll be one in your district also. Yeah, so. that's what I am sure. Yeah. Yeah. If you want, you can use my image uh, for your uh, audience as well. I would, I would love you. What, what's the animal that you – I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Man. No, please. I, I went out there I, he services. deserves it. Go <laughs> after him. Go on. <laughs> video, and they brought yeah. this, you know, cute dog out, and I was like, oh. oh was, it, was it short? Why did you have your dog? With I didn't bring my dog, and he was not pleased when I got home because uh, <laughs> he could smell the other dog. Out. Yeah, so wow. I was unfaithful. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it was it's booked up, and I'm looking forward to it. It's to be a, a great success out of GT Bray. And thank one. you so much to Sarah Brown. Uh, yeah. I appreciate everything Animal Services is doing for us. So and that's who, all, Madam Chair. Who's paying for it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Manatee Community Foundation. Oh, Manatee oh. Community Foundation. I did they know that. So is that why maybe there's not one out east somewhere? Maybe. I don't know, but thank you to the Manatee Community Foundation. Uh, I actually have a fund low. with the Manatee Community Foundation. So. We're doing the low income. All right, um, Commissioner Cruz. Yeah. Thank you. I just got one thing that was just uh, handed to me after a discussion over lunch, and uh, we wrote it up. I've, I've made it pretty obvious in, in a number of our conversations about parks and about infrastructure and so forth that, you know, as opposed to, to the road focus that, that a lot of people have, and rightfully so. I've been trying to focus on our greenways and our trails and ways of multimodal access, outdoor activity throughout Manatee County, and I've spent um, a fair bit of time with, with the director of parks, Charlie Hunsinger, on this and talking about plans we've had. And one issue has always been funding for it. And we just found out very recently, maybe today, that uh, you know, there's project opportunities at, 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 for the federal level, for the federal surface transportation reauthorization bill, that we can work towards requesting funds uh, as part of an agreement that the Republicans are trying to, to work out to make this infrastructure plan work. And by doing so, we can utilize it for this trail system and, and simultaneously free up some of the state DOT money we've been asking for for the Palmetto multimodal trail system so they can reappropriate it in other places in Manatee County. 
So uh, what I was asking and what was just written up uh, is a requested motion by this board, a motion to authorize the chair to request that Congressman Buchanan seek up to $20 million in funding in the Federal Surface Transportation Reauthorization Bill for the Palmetto Multimodal Trail Project. Second. Second, if you didn't. Wow, that was fast. Yeah, I think, I think it, we I think came it has to be in like today or tomorrow to, to get into this bill. But if we get this, not only will we incorporate the, the Palmetto trail system, but also the entire countywide trail system we've been working on and reappropriate the funds we've been asking for. So, Okay. All right, so we have a motion by Commissioner Cruz, a second by Commissioner Bellamy. I'm going to go ahead and open this to public comment, and then I will get to Commissioner comments. Um, anyone? Thank you. Anyone from the public want to come forward on this item? Not seeing anyone. Seth, do we have any phone calls? No, Madam Chair, no calls. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore. It was in the newspaper or online, because I don't get the newspaper, uh, last night that Buchanan asked for $26 million, something like that, and part of that was what you just stated. It wasn't the $10 million you said, because he, he asked for $10 million for Moat. But... Uh, but he, um, it was, it was in the millions, I think. Yeah, we have, we're requesting, to, we're requesting. I know what you're, for I know what you're requesting. I, I, but he did. Uh, there was something yesterday that he had made a big request, um, and so you may want to make sure that it all jives with Jocelyn about what's going on because he, it was just yesterday he allocated it. I think if anybody hadn't separate. seen it. Uh, well, wait a minute. The county administrator would like to say something. Yeah, I, I was going to mention that there are a number of bills that that was a that was in a in a different bill. Right. Yesterday. Right. Yeah, right. it was yesterday. And I believe I looked at the list that you're referring to. And Moat was and, 10. Uh, yes, Moat had, uh, uh, yes, 10 million. Uh, Manatee had one item, and it was for Pace for Girls. Right. Right. So and this, this, is, Manatee, this is specifically this is for, a, in a transportation oh, no. authorization bill. Yeah. Yeah, something else. So... Uh, any other comments, commissioners, before we vote? All right, not seeing anyone. We'll go ahead then. Uh, motion to approve. Raise your hands, please. Just easier this way. All right, Madam Clerk, it's unanimous. Anyone? I'll go ahead and say it, though. Um, any nays? No, of course not. It, it is unanimous. Thank you. Good job. Madam um, Chair, did you, did you public comment on that? I did. You did? Oh, did? Okay. I did. There wasn't any. Um, Commissioner Satcher, any comments, sir? Uh, I I went on my way into work today. I was listening to the radio in Sarasota. I may get the numbers off because I was driving, uh, but they just purchased, I believe it was 1,400 acres uh, right on the, uh, anyway, there in Sarasota County, and I think the purchase price was $3.2 million, if I heard it uh, correctly, something like that. I did the math real quick while I was driving, and I think it was twenty thousand an acre. Um, so it was it was a conservation easement, not the actual purchase okay. of the land. Okay, that is, is that cheap. how they got the for that money? Yeah, yeah, thousand that's an acre. Wow. I was like, we need to have that person negotiate on our behalf. <laughs> it's a big <laughs> difference. <laughs> well, I bring it up just to say that uh, the voters did vote overwhelmingly uh, for the environmental lands, um, and so we do need to to stay on that. And I assume that other uh, things. Or I know that there are things happening behind the scenes, but I do just want to keep that in front of us that uh, even regardless of how we all personally voted, um, the people voted pretty overwhelmingly um, to make that a priority, and so I want to keep that um, on, our, on our minds. Thank and that you. is coming back in a workshop. Great. Thank you. Yes, hopefully sooner than later. Uh, Commissioner Bellamy? Nope. Nothing? Oh, Commissioner Servia. Yeah, I had a busy week, so if you'll just uh, stay with me here for a few minutes, I'd like to share a few things. Um, starting off with the workshop that we had Tuesday. It was absolutely outstanding. Thank you for putting it together. Um, I, everybody did a great job. I appreciated the homelessness discussion and the strategic master plan discussion, and I've already started my first book. I have two. Um, me too. Uh, uh, I want to thank Jerry Lopez for taking me on an economic development tour last Friday. Uh, it's always great to go out with her. If you guys haven't done it recently, you should, because there is so much going on. And uh, it is because of her department largely and our Bradenton area EDC working so hard with these companies who are relocating here. So great things happening. Um, 
Monday, I attended the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee meeting, and I promised that I would bring something up. Um, there was a great idea that every affordable housing project be, uh, that has a LURA, okay, so an official affordable housing project, um, be either a time certain or first on the agenda. Because having uh, all the professionals sit through a day-long meeting adds up and just is uh, contrary to providing housing affordably. So I thought that was a great idea. I'd like to make a motion, please, to have that happen. So my motion is uh, all affordable housing projects that contain a LURA be first on the agenda or at a time certain. Second. I'll second. Oh, okay. George. Oh, way. We have a motion by Commissioner Servia, a second by, you know, by Commissioner Cruz. Uh, before we vote, I will open it to public comment. Anyone want to speak on this item? <coughs> Seth, any phone calls? No, ma'am. Um, any discussions uh, before the vote by commissioners? I don't see anyone on the yeah, board. I'll just, just say, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, Go ahead. it... it, it it's going to sound small and maybe even to some people somewhat insignificant, but it's not because we need to chip away any way we can. And even a dollar here, a dollar there, uh, you know, unlike in, in some cases from a market standpoint, affordable housing developers typically do pass on those savings. That's how they make it affordable. So even if we're just saving them a few hundred dollars per hour on their attorneys to get them in earlier on a time certain, it's just that many more couple of dollars that they can trim off of the rent so that I'm 100% on board with, with this and any other minor thing we can do at no cost to ourselves to benefit the affordable housing. All right, I, I'm next on the board and I do have a question on this. You know, everyone that comes in here for an application has people that they, they are responsible for that they pay for. So when you say the word affordable housing, Yes, it's very important, but at the same time, are there, and I don't know, I'm not familiar with the, um, with the regulations, the Commissioner Servia, that you recommended. Um, is it, does that mean that the affordable housing is always affordable and ever changes back? I don't know. I'm not familiar with it. So, Madam Chairman, the LURA, the L-U-R-A document, is what ensures that it is truly an affordable housing project as designated by Manatee County. So well, that means 25% of the housing is affordable per our regulations. Yes. Okay, well, let me ask you this. You say it's only 25% of that project. A minimum Are of 25%. They, okay, I understand. Does, those, does that 25% minimally always stay no, it's not, a, it's not in perpetuity. I think it's for 10 years, and John Barnott is going to come up. Oh, he's not going to come up. <laughs> I, I think it's for 10 years, if I'm correct, I, although it's really a question for uh, Jerry I Lopez. think you are. It's really uh, Denise and, and Jerry's group that administers that agreement. Yes. It, it, it does lock in the affordable housing for a period of time. Okay, I, I, I just have no idea. I, I can sort of answer it. The, the law is a fully negotiable document, uh, whether it's 25% or 50 or 100% affordable, whether it's Spinnable. 10 years or, you know, I believe City of Bradenton just did eight years right. on the, the first union building here. Right. There's no set timeline. Traditionally, we've been sticking with the 10 years. It seemed to be the common number. But that right. said, if somebody was trying to get a little more from us, maybe a little extra sewer or a little more benefits or a little more... They could promise 20 years, 30 years, 50 years into perpetuity. In theory, there's nothing restricting us to no more or no less than 10 years. It's, it's a negotiable document. And I, I guess that's why I'm asking the, the, these questions, because I, I really don't like the fact that people come in here and, and they have what they call affordable housing, which is awesome, and I'm glad. But at the same time, I wish there was some way that we could... Um, put forth a plan to, to continue with the affordable housing and not just for eight years or 10 years or whatever. I mean, the, it needs to stay that because we're not getting ahead in the game. Well, if, Madam know, Chairman, I, I have good news for you. So one of the ways that we're looking at doing that is through a land trust. And that is something that Jerry Lopez talked about at our affordable housing committee meeting. And I'm sure it's gonna come back to the board 
and that would provide affordable housing for a longer period of time. That might be, but that's not really what I was talking about. But anyway, thank you for that, Commissioner Servia. Commissioner Cruz, yes, sir. Yeah. Community Land Trust was actually the second half of the affordable housing work session that we cut short last exactly. time. It's, I believe, next Wednesday. Either next Wednesday or the Wednesday after, one of those additional work sessions we had, it is, I believe it's next Wednesday, is the continuation, which is going to be inclusive right. of Community Land Trust. So we are going to be hearing about it. It's, a, it's an amazing program. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of Community Land Trust. Uh, I hear what you're saying about the Loras and making them into perpetuity. Uh, the, the, that, that, that's, first off, that, that's really hard to get. Even federal loan housing tax credits typically don't go over between 15 and 30 years. I, I would love to see it, but it starts becoming economically unsound after a while. And in all honesty, once something becomes 20, 30 years old, it almost comes naturally affordable in its own right just due to age and obsolescence. So it, it, it's almost a little overkill. I think this conversation is great for the work session we're having, not to cut it short, but I think the concept of what Commissioner Servia is bringing forth is, is a great concept. And discussing how we want Jerry to negotiate Laura's, I think is a bigger discussion from a policy standpoint we should be having in so, a bigger context. So, okay, than, well, thank you. But, and that's the reason I'm asking these questions because I want to vote for this, but I wanted to make sure I understood what I was voting for. So if I understand you, you, Commissioner Cruz, when this comes up before us, when we have a workshop, we can talk about extending that, or is that just a federal program that we really have no control over? No, lawyers are local. They're okay. not federal. Right. And, and we, like I said, we're having a, a, an all things housing continuation next Wednesday. We can even ask the county administrator to add discussions about policy related to Laura's. Jerry's going to be there anyway. Okay, good. But this is affordable. But the nice thing about incorporating the Laura component to it, which Commissioner Sherby did, is it's not just somebody implying it's affordable because of its location or I promise you something. They have to sign a Laura. So that, that's telling us that, that Jerry and Denise and everyone have deemed it to be affordable enough to meet the requirements she's asking, which I think is a very reasonable motion. Yes, and may I also offer, and, and keeping that housing affordable for a long period of time, remember that when we give down payment assistance to people and then they end up selling their house 10 years later, 20 years later, they pay us back that down payment assistance. I know that. Which yeah. then, so it, it does, in perpetuity, it does serve people if you look at it that way. Well, I was just concerned about a longer period of time. That's why I was asking. Um, Mr. County Administrator. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Um, Chair and members, I'm going to ask you not to do this today because I am working with staff with regards to making these meetings flow more effectively and efficiently. And one of the things is to, to try to anticipate the time, uh, the number of people that will be uh, addressing a topic. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it in the future, but the, the more you layer time certains onto it, it makes it difficult for us to work through. Uh, as you know, Mr. Clegg and I are, are working through recommendations with regards to, to amendments to your, your operating procedures and your bylaws. Part of that is how meetings are conducted, how things are scheduled. I hear what you're trying to accomplish. And at any meeting, at any meeting, you can change the order of the agenda items. If I know it, during this period of time before, between now and the recess, right? because at, when you come back after recess, we're really going to be talking about a lot of uh, um, issues relating to meetings, agendas, and, and having the meetings be efficient as possible. I hear what you're saying. I think when you, when, you, when you have something as broad as, okay, it's an affordable housing issue and it's got a land use restriction agreement, uh, that could end up being pretty broad. And if we end up with meetings where we've got three, four, five times certains and we're, we're not able to, to flow, that could be a problem. I would just ask, give, give, give us a little bit of time to react to the problem you're trying to solve and how we can do it. If it's a time certain, that'd be great. I'm just concerned that we've got a number of pieces that the county attorney and I are working on with regards to the board, bylaws, meetings, uh, how items get on the agenda, the order of the agenda, that if you start kind of micromanaging it at this early stage of the game, 
by having mandates of certain items or going to be time certain that we could end up with some un unintended consequences. Um, um, so I'm a, I'm wait, on the board. okay, hold up. It's, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, oh. Commissioner Sarvi, I'm going to let Commissioner Whitmore go because she is next on the board. Okay. Well, I don't agree um, respectfully, Dr. Hopes. Uh, okay. This is uh, uh, we are begging for affordable housing, and if we can. Time, time is money, many of you all have say up there. Um, whether, uh, the 20 and 30 years and all that that we were talking about, that's something we can talk about next week. But I think we need to give an incentive for affordable housing, and if that's what it takes to have a time certain, um, I would support that. I, I mean, just incentive that we don't, they're not spending tons of money for an affordable housing project because they gotta wait till 10 o'clock at night because we've been, uh, had 10 things ahead of them. So, you know, we haven't had a lot of affordable housing. Uh, it died a few years back, and now we're starting to see it. And I think what, there should be some kind of incentive, and that would be a way. So I kind of agree with Commissioner Cruz and Commissioner Miss uh, Servia on all that. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. I just have been when I heard that, I thought, what a great idea. And I might add to what Commissioner Whitmore just said, real quick, that, and and Mr. County Administrator, I think you said it as well. We already can do it because we can move uh, any item we want forward. So it's up to the chair and it, only if they agree and if not, then we have to override the chair. So it's not that easy. And usually when we get here, we're already to start the meeting. And so just think about it. Yeah, well, I, I don't care. Y'all can do whatever you want. I'm just saying we, we already have that. Yes, sir. Yeah, one, to that point, one of the suggestions in changing the bylaws and the operating procedures is that any member can request or make a motion to move an item somewhere else on agenda. The whole goal, the whole goal of the transitioning to the new briefing style and things like that is to get input before the agenda is published. I agree with you. I mean, that, that we want to make doing business with Manatee County government as efficient and as effective, which includes efficiency, as possible. And to be sensitive to the needs when, you know, when someone is putting forth a program and they've got a smaller margin than maybe a large developer and they've got three attorneys there at $400 an hour, I get it. All I'm asking is that I kind of hear what you're saying. Yeah, I would like the opportunity to come up with the, the solutions. If you want to do this now, it's certainly your prerogative. All I'm saying is, is that I, I hear what you're doing. Just make sure I, I it, it's kind of thrown out. I haven't heard it until now. Um, to me, that's not a good way to do things. If it is an incentive, then we should be able to measure that that's the incentive, that we'll have more people coming forward with affordable housing if we give them a time certain for a meeting. I just hope we're not opening the floodgates to everybody else who has projects and has engineers and has attorneys, and then we're debating on who has the smallest margin. But I'm okay with it. I, it it's your decision, obviously. I'm just weighing in that we're, we're, we're working on this and other issues with regards to the agenda. We haven't had time to have a workshop on your agenda and on operating procedures. Um, and, and now we're kind of like going to mandate things at the end of a land use meeting on this kind of topic. But that's my comments, Madam Chair. Commissioner Van Austin Bridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I support the direction that you're trying to go, Commissioner Servia. Um, my question would be essentially the administrator is pleading for an opportunity to bring us a bigger picture, you know, as to how the meetings would go and flow. And he does hear what you're asking and understands that the rest of the board agrees with you, or at least <coughs> most of us that have spoken at this point agree with you. Uh, I say I, I would like us to give him an opportunity to, to bring us, you know, a plan. And if we don't like it, then, you know, go for your mandate then. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Cruz. Uh, I mean, if we run into a situation where we open the floodgates of people with lure agreements piling in here, then that's an unintended consequence I'm willing to deal with. You know, the, the, the reality is, what do we sign? Maybe I, I, I know you weren't referring to lure stuff. You don't have to correct that. 
the, the reality is, what do we sign? Maybe five loros a year. This isn't this isn't like every work every land use meeting we ever have is going to be completely blown up on its agenda. Do this. It, it, it's a small handful of things. It's a small give to show people and project to people that we as a board are willing to work with our affordable housing providers in any way we can, large or small. It's a small handful of a couple of deals every now and then. I do not see this being a problem in the long-term readjustment of our agendas. I'm still 100% on board with this. I'm still going to vote for this. We're setting the policy, and the administration can work around the policy set. I think this is a very nominal give and a very, a very minor inconvenience to whatever the bigger picture is going to be. Commissioner Servia. Yeah, and certainly I don't want to make our administrator's job any more difficult than it is. But what Commissioner Cruz said is accurate. It's a handful. It's a few luras a year. And it's not even an incentive. It's just slicing off a little bit of the problem and all of those little problems add up to real money in the affordable housing world. Um, so I, I do support that we do this. And another reason is I have so many things on my mind. I don't want to have to think about, oh, we have to reorder the agenda because something's affordable. I just want it taken care of. So that's my um, position. May I hear the motion again? <laughs> uh, Madam Clerk. What is the motion again, please? Okay. Thank you. Madam Chairman, the motion on the floor is that all projects that contain a LORA be first on the agenda or be at a time certain. The motion was made by Commissioner Servia and seconded by Commissioner uh, Cruz. Thank you. I don't think that's what I heard because you're talking about a LORA. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but but it was. all LORAs don't have affordable housing in it. They do. No. They do. Yes, they do. Well, you're thinking of an LDA. No, I'm thinking of land use. Restriction agreements. Agreement. You're saying that we only use land use restriction agreements for sir. affordable housing? Yes, sir. You're thinking of a local developer's agreement, which is different. No, I'm, I'm, I was thinking the broader term. As long as we include at the, uh, the suggestion is, I have no problem with being at the beginning of a meeting or no. time certain if we can't accommodate at the beginning of the meeting. The clarification is it at the beginning of the meeting or the first item of business? Is it before? Proclamation. The, Proclamations or well, I I well I didn't know I had to clarify that, but I would think well, it would well, be the first I, order you of do business. If you're going to give me clear direction, okay. Well, the first order of business. Yes, that's how I understood it. Uh, I'm next on the board, and I was just going to say that actually, um, this is great because we have the best of both worlds. We can go ahead with this motion at this time, and. Uh, in, in, in your dealings with Mr. Clegg, you know, y'all can also look at this issue and if you have better ideas, you can bring it back to the board, yes. uh, you know, where we can, of course, adjust what we're doing at that time if, if we would rather see something else. So it, it's kind of a win-win, really. It, it gets us doing it faster. Uh, I mean, that's what I'm seeing and hearing. And, I, and I'm all for helping affordable housing. I just wish it was for a longer period of time. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore. In all due respect, Dr. Hopes, I'm waffling on both sides because I understand where you're coming from, but you've heard the, the number of projects that we come every year, and I think the clear direction that you just heard would be the first item after proclamation, you know, the first item of agenda. And I, I would acquiesce also that uh, when you guys talk about the meetings, if you and um, our attorney don't agree or want to bring up another suggestion, I think we should be open to that. But I mean, to me, it's like a courtesy to affordable housing, not an incentive e even. And I know, I know you're, you're trying to get this all orchestrated, but this is the first time this idea has come up before us. And we haven't had affordable housing in a long time, in a, like a very few a year. And to see, to, and we're, we're actually getting some projects that are coming before us now that I think we really want to encourage that, as you know. Nobody can afford 2300 in affordable housing now. So um, I, might I add, still don't know how I'm going to vote yet. I might add that actually on future land use uh, agendas, we're not even supposed to have any proclamations there you go. on them. So it is so, the first one. Cause, and that's one of the things that has been discussed because we're trying to figure out how to expedite mm -hmm. land use matters. So, Commissioner Cruz? No, I'm good. Why is he talking? 
Okay. Um, Chair, I call the question. Second. Second. All right, the question's been called uh, by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, second by Commissioner Bellamy. Um, do I have to open that to public comment? Yeah. I mean, I don't no, have to. Do you for calling questions? I think, do I? Yeah. I okay. thought so. Question? All right, I'm opening it to public comment. Is there anyone that would like to speak on this issue? Would you please get up and speak? For calling a question, right? Seth, for calling the question. No, ma'am. No. We're closing public comment. All in favor of calling the question, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Nay. Madam Clerk, it's, did you say, say nay? nay. <laughs> totally. I would oh, out for don't do that to me. Well, I was, I was repeating. Repeats what he said. It is approved aye. unanimously. <laughs> Can you repeat the motion? Okay. <laughs> Can you repeat, repeat it? Repeat the motion, please. Madam Chairman, the motion on the floor is for all projects that contain Alora be first on the agenda or be at a time certain. You guys made a discussion about it being after proclamations, but that wasn't clear that it was part of the motion. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's not. not. Okay. okay. Misty, it's not part of proclamation because there's probably not going to be any. No. I, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary unless the board does. No. no. But I'm ready to vote. Just, okay. just just let it go. Scott's over all right. it. <laughs> uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Madam Clerk, it's approved unanimously. Six Thank to you. One. Um, no. Six to one? I don't think so. No, it was. Who was? No. I heard somebody so, say nay. James oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're looking at you again, James. <laughs> okay. Sorry. No, it was I unanimous. Apologize. I apologize. Okay. There, and, and as I said before, um, you know, <laughs> when. Um, um, when the county administrator and, and Mr. Clegg get together, if they come out with some better ideas, of course that will be brought back to the board, and then we can see if we want to amend it. Um, Commissioner Bellamy. I, w I wasn't done. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> don't do any more like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no more motions. Uh, but to finish up on the Affordable Housing Committee, just want to say again, the staff did an excellent job. Wait till you see the presentation on land trusts. And I'm going to ask that whoever sets up the meetings for the Affordable Housing Committee, please include a copy of the civility pledge for the uh, chair to have. I think it needs to be read at those meetings. At what meetings? Did I do something? No, Affordable no, no, Housing Advisory yeah. Committee. Oh, oh, I thought she meant me. I thought, what did I do? Okay. Oh, we've got a copy of it here, I think. She's used of it all the time. But. Um, last Friday, I had the pleasure of doing a hospital tour at Lakewood Ranch and also at Manatee Memorial. And uh, I just want to say they are two very impressive hospitals. We're so lucky to have them. Uh, Lakewood Ranch Hospital is rated an A, for those of you who didn't know that. And uh, stroke and heart attacks are their thing right now <laughs> at both hospitals. And they have just the, the top of the line technology. So that was excellent. Um, I want to thank the START group, uh, which I'm not sure what it stands for, but it, they uh, try to help Red Tide. Solutions to, Solutions avoid, red to tide. avoid Red Tide. Sandy uh, met with me and some other people on a pond issue and uh, has great information for how to make our stormwater ponds more effective and, and avoid erosion. And so I sent him our land development code standards that we currently have for ponds, which does not include any sort of landscaping or no, no mow zones, but uh, he, is, he may send us some recommended language in the future. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hopes, for all the support that he gives to me at my neighborhood meetings. He's been with me now for three, I think, and two or three, 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 three and um, has just been a real asset in doing that. And it's taken a lot of time, so I thank you. Um, as we come up to the break, I want to encourage everyone to be very flexible with these meetings. And if we have to go past five o'clock, it'll be okay. We, we don't want to go till nine because then we're not making good decisions. But if, if we have to go late to get business done, I think that we all just need to do it. Um, last night, I was at the Citizens Coalition on Growth meeting in District 4, uh, a very good discussion. Uh, they had a, a couple of good ideas on ADUs, and I think they're going to write a letter as that gets finalized. Um, and then my last, no, two more comments, cell phones. If I could please just ask um, 
politely ask everybody who sits on the board that when we're at a workshop or at a board meeting, if they'll just not be on their cell phones. It, I just think it's a matter of being polite and respectful to the speakers. So I hope that we can all try to do that. Um, and then finally, state bills. So this year there were two bills that passed that give me a little bit of concern. One is the home-based business bill, and one is the code enforcement bill that no longer allows anonymous complaints. Those directly affect our neighborhoods. Um, and so I've talked to Dr. Hopes about this and uh, to Nick, and maybe next year we can have our lobbyist uh, give us a little bit more feedback on these things that affect local government so that we can know ahead of time if they're getting traction, that maybe if we'd like to give some comments or write letters, we could do so. The home-based business bill will allow uh, neighborhoods without <coughs> homeowners associations, which are the neighborhoods in my district and in Bellamy's district and in Kevin's district, um, uh, to have a home-based business, up to five employees. You can have signs, you can have storage, you can pave a little parking lot to store equipment. Really kind of changes, could change the character of the neighborhood. Uh, I have a lot of people concerned in my district about that. And I hope that next year it has changed because I, I'm really worried about that. And then the code enforcement uh, bill, I believe what it says is we local governments can no longer take anonymous complaints. And so I'll give you the example of the 80-year-old fragile woman who lives alone and is concerned about making a complaint against her neighbor because she's concerned for her safety. Uh, that, that's going to prohibit people like that from making anonymous complaints. Now, I'm not an attorney. Maybe our legal staff is going to tell us we have nothing to worry about. So I look forward to their interpretation of the bills. Um, but I hope to be that we're more involved next year with our lobbyist. And that's all I have. Thanks. You evidently have a lot of commissioners that want to comment. Um, Commissioner Satcher, you're first. I actually am not speaking directly to uh, what she was talking about, but I did. Um, I had a couple of things that I forgot to say. Uh, number one is with. Can we wait and get back to you, you want on that to, if that's we the can. case? Um, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. My comment is not related to Commissioner Serbia's okay, either. If you would hit your oh, after you this. Commissioner Cruz. Mine is just to let you know. I mean, it's a year away, so I probably have to look it up again. Uh, FAC actually did something this year because I'm, I'm massively against any form of the, the state taking any any decisions away from counties and cities. Um, they had something of a tracker that specifically focused only on bills that were going through that had to do with things that could directly impact the counties. And every day, in some cases, in the heart of it, they were giving updates in terms of what was going on. It was a pretty good tool. I, I read it constantly just to keep up with things from the port to the vacation rentals to the the code enforcement it, it was a pretty good tool this session exactly yeah thank you for telling me about that I did see their summary and I read their emails but I did not know they had a tracker yeah. so um, yeah I, I didn't know about those two bills until it was just before the approval date uh, Commissioner Whitmore, did you want to comment, ma'am? Yeah, I, I serve on the governor's um, efficiency task force. Uh, I was appointed by Senator Galvano, and we actually submitted our report. Uh, it has to be due by June 5th, and we submitted it to him. And one of the items that you're talking about was rentals. And I want you to read because um, me coming from a city, home speech, we have an occupational license, and our reason is is Certain businesses we deem essential get a colored tag, so when it's time to reenter after the island is evacuated, which it has since I've lived there, they're allowed on first. And um, my members of my board, Senator Rodriguez and Matt Caldwell, they weren't aware that actually some cities use it for that. So what the language is that we submitted to the governor is the task force recognizes that when both the city and county requires business occupancy taxes, it increases expenses for business owners. However, the tax force also recognizes that these taxes created rec create records that facilitate emergency management and issues related to property leases. To address these issues, the task force recommends the legislator limit the amount charged for their licenses to no more than what the cost of administrating the license. And I think that's what they did, because I remember I talked to a city this week, and they were very upset because some cities are getting millions of dollars from occupational license. And this was, um, I think, the League of 
counties, Association of Counties came before us and talked about it. Um, so yeah, but I agree with you, two or three cars and employees in a house in a quiet neighborhood, you know, they're, they're taking away our home rule. We don't have a business tax, that's different, but other cities do, so I don't, but I want you to know that's what we submitted to the governor and since I've already, we submitted it, I'll copy all you guys for it so you can see what we did. Commissioner Bellamy. Yes, Madam Chair, my comment is not related to this okay, topic. Okay, we'll come back to Please you. Please do, ma'am. Okay. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, is that in relation to this? Sir? No. Okay, well. But I think Satcher was up and then me. That's what I was, yeah. That's, I was just I, trying I to keep button, so it, it together on line. what we were discussing at the time. Commissioner Satcher, did you want to go ahead, sir? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. Um, on the, uh, you know, Commissioner Van Osterbridge did a great job with the uh, vaccine, um, vaccination deal for pets. And so I just wanted to say that I, and I forgot to say earlier that I've already uh, contacted and, and, putting that together for District 1, for Parish, uh, that area, and um, asked around in the community and seemed to get a real good uh, favorable reaction. So I also wanted to uh, mention that there was a fatal uh, crash on Moccasin Wallow. I wanted to um, just let the citizens know, first of all, if we put a you know, who gets frustrated at government and how slow it works, I'm gonna be raising my hand, is very frustrated with that. Uh, but I do just want to let you know uh, that we had six million come from the state this year to help with that project. Uh, we're putting, the county's putting in major money, uh, millions of dollars on that project. Uh, it is front and center. And, uh, and many of us have spoken uh, <laughs> many times that we wished it, that some of these projects had been taken up and made a priority earlier. Maybe they couldn't, maybe, but um, but we're beyond that now, and we are uh, making it, uh, you know, a priority. So I hate to see that. Um, got to um, see Senator Jim Boyd. Um, at uh, he came to the uh, emergency operation command for the county and just had a great time. And my dad was in town because of the new baby and. Uh, ended up, you know, with uh, Senator Boyd sitting there telling uh, <laughs> old stories from the old days, and uh, it, it was just, you know, it was it was great time. And so, I just appreciate him uh, being there, and uh, and all the people at the county with their staff. Um, you know, I will point out when it comes to this home rule stuff, um, if we're going to be really upset about every time home rule isn't honored by the state, then we should take our responsibility seriously to make good policy and to consider with a lot of weight when the governor sets a very clear precedent and asks us to do something, we should consider doing that because it makes our home look bad uh, when we're not doing what the person that got the, you know, the overwhelming, uh, that got voted as our governor. So, um, you know, so that's gonna continue to be an issue. Um, what would be nice would be if we were making some better decisions um, you know, at all levels. So. Um, I also want to, for the future, I want us to look into, um, the governor already mentioned having local fines uh, not enforceable, that they cannot be for COVID-related um, infractions, that they can't be collected on by local governments. Um, I'd like to go lower than that uh, if possible, so I want the county uh, administrator to look into uh, whether or not, there were a lot of HOAs um, that uh, really, that put a lot of fines on uh, citizens in their neighborhoods uh, for things that were directly related to the pandemic. You, you've got somebody that's working as a, a nurse and uh, you've got somebody at home that's vulnerable and they own a trailer, you know, uh, one of these tow behind small trailers. So they wanted their nurse, the, her to be able to sleep outside and not bring that home and HOAs uh, were fining people. Uh, maybe we don't have that authority, um, but, I want the, but I think we should look into it. And even if we don't have the authority, we can make a statement that we disapprove of it, uh, that we're gonna protect our consumers and our citizens um, from uh, governmental uh, administrative bodies that have uh, taken um, small issues and made them into uh, major issues and made it as a, a additional uh, stress on people when they were already going through a hard time. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bellamy, Commissioner comments, sir. Yes, uh, a couple of things, and Commissioner Serve, you kind of brought it up to my attention. I also toured 
the um, Manatee Memorial Hospital, the Lakewood Ranch had to be rescheduled because um, I had to get me and my mom a second vaccination. Um, but I did enjoy the tour, and I learned a lot. But it's a lot of great things that go on at Manatee Memorial Hospital. You know, I always told the EMS and the hospital, you know, thank you. Um, once my brother flatlined, and then I had a relative that had a stroke a couple months back, and they talked to us during the tour about, you know, those 60 minutes and how, how, how important those 60 minutes are. Um, so that, that was a great learning opportunity for me. Um, I, I do want to um, say something about um, what's going on at the Mixing Fruit Farms. Did you all get that email? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all got it. Yeah. We all responded and got a thank you note. <laughs> Done. All Pretty right. much, yeah. Yep, all right. All right. I try to make sure I stay within 24 hours. So it was 419 yesterday, so I'm still doing pretty good. All right. So that kind of concludes me. <laughs> all right. Great. Um, so I have no way of knowing that you all have responded. No. Right? Right. 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 So. All right. Put We're, that out there. All of the commissioners now really have spoken, so I'm going to go back and just go by the board again. Commissioner Van Osterbridge, you're next. Sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just, the, to Commissioner Satcher, the accident on Moccasin Wallow, when the secretary came, uh, transportation came to town on Monday, uh, Sheriff Wells spoke on road safety, and that accident specifically was referenced. Yeah. And Moccasin Wallow, this, you know, road safety on Moccasin Wallow, Vernon Bethany, State Road 70, um, they were all referenced. After we did a rubbernecking circle around Piney Point when we took off, uh, we then went directly to Moccasin Wallow. Uh, so your district was covered extensively on the, the uh, aerial tour, and Moccasin Wallow was the first first place we went, uh, followed by Upper Manatee and you know Fort Hamer and then on to Lena. But, um, I just want to make sure that you knew that road safety was a large part of the presentation, and it was the f first thing we really talked about when we got in the air after Piney Point. Um, and John Barnott is here, and this may or may not be appropriate to discuss here. So if, if a private briefings are the better way to go, I'm still getting emails and phone calls about the medieval fair issue in Mayaka. Private, yeah. Could you maybe one-on-one -on -one all of us, if that's not something we should discuss right. now? Um, could we get updates on that, you know, just so we know what to tell people when they're calling us? So, okay, and that's all, Madam Chair. Thank okay, you. Commissioner Serbia? Yes, um, I just wanted to add to the Moccasin Wallow comments and let Commissioner Satcher know that it ha that road has been a big priority for years. So I I'm glad that the money is accumulating and, and it is expanding. So thank you for your work on that. Commissioner Whitmore? And if it hadn't been for Pat Neal, going to Tallahassee, and it took this long. I remember him dealing with Governor Scott about this. So it has been, and, and then, you know, then we finally got the money for 44th, so that, you know, they only gave us so much. But, uh, and I, a couple times I think it got denied um, when it did get as far as the governor's desk. But two things, first of all, you pulled a major coup off by getting the Secretary of Transportation here. Yeah. And I don't, I didn't see anything about it. and. That, I don't think that happens very often um, where we just happened to go to a meeting and the Secretary of Transportation came up and did what they did because we are looking at Moccasin Wallow and other areas, 44th. So um, that, um, I don't even know if there was a press release, was there? There needs to be one. I posted it. Well, the Secretary's, the Secretary's office requested no, awesome. no press oh. prior to the visit. What about after? Uh, we wanted it to be like a real working visit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, we didn't do a big press release. Uh, one, the Manatee Herald news outlet got a hold of it, and they called, um, and I sent them two pictures and gave an interview, and obviously they got a hold of Dr. Hopes as well, and he gave an interview. I so think we should have a press the, release for our major media, because ABC7 and all that, you know? Sure, I'll get with Nick on and that. And then also the HOA, um, Commissioner Satcher, there are, and our attorneys here, and this is kind of land use related in a way, there are major restrictions on HOAs, and um, they they use government funding, help me guys, for the, the streets and stuff, and the residents pay fees to maintain the infrastructure. But uh, And they set their rules, and I have, some of you all live in HOAs. And so putting a mobile home just uh, for a nurse to stay in, you can't even put a boat in your driveway on some of them, and that's why I choose not to live in an HOA, because there is one, Key Royal, and I lived there, and I, they told me I had to put my garage door down, so I moved. Um, but I, legally, I don't think we can, but somebody smarter than me that knows, I, not me. Can, is it okay about dialogue? Absolutely. Can I ask the attorney first and then see? Cause I'm I asking don't. her not to enter in on this. I did not ask whether you approve with what I brought up. 
I know. So I'm just telling you, I, I ask for us to look into the issue to see what we can do to help citizens that were put in a bad spot by bad decisions that may have been made. That's a simple ask. I don't need your, whether you agree with it, whether you think it's legal, what the details are of some neighborhood's rules. I ask for something pretty simple. If they bring it forward and they say, this is the best thing we can do on that, and you vote against it, that's your prerogative. But I don't see any reason why I need you to agree. Obviously, we disagree on a lot of things. So I don't, I don't, I'm not asking. Uh, what I am asking is that we, as a government, and as people, start to listen to the people a little bit more, to the people that put us here. So that's why we're working hard for Marcus and Wallow. That's why Kevin's taking his time uh, you know, to talk to, those, to the secretary of uh, the DOT. Um, you know, that's what's important. There's nothing wrong with us seeing what ability we do have to help people that are put in a bad spot, um, especially uh, if we do have authority. If we don't, fine. We write letters all the time to people we don't have authority over. We wrote a letter to the governor of Florida, likely, possibly, the future president of the United States, telling him our opinion on something. Does he really care? We don't know. But we thought that it might be worth our time to write a letter. Well, maybe if we just end up with a letter saying, don't fine people $1,000 for having a basketball goal hey. that they put in their in yeah. their driveway so their kids could have yeah. somewhere to go and something to do. I don't need your approval on that. I didn't ask for your approval. I have okay. no idea why you would want to comment on right. it. And let's, I'm still on, I'm let's still let's on the know. board. I'm still on the board. Ms. Ms. We're Mr. not going to go back and forth I want to this. apologize, Commissioner Satcher, if I oh. upset him. Obviously, well, I did. Let you do that. I just wanted to know, I don't think we have authority, and I only asked the attorney. I wasn't saying I don't agree or disagree, and I don't even know if the person got a fine and if they get it from the county or the HOA. I don't know. We don't know the whole situation. Yeah, I made notes Sorry of about that. commission comments, and we'll work with the ministry. I haven't even done mine yet. Back. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> you. Not to well. give off the cop legal advice. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cruz. <laughs> I'm taking myself off. It was about an HOA. I'm, I'm done for the day. <laughs> uh, he lives in an HOA. You better not. Are we done? Thank you. Uh, no, I'm going to just, I only have a couple of things, but nothing about an HOA. But I, I do want to say, Commissioner Satcher, I do love the fact that you take up for the citizens in this county, and, and I admire you for that. So thank you for your comments. Uh, Commissioner Servia, your comment about cell phones, I could not agree with you more. And I, I think I brought it up here on the dais, and, and every one of you, uh, you know, not surprisingly, none of you wanted to hear that about not doing any texting or, email, you know, nothing on your cell phones when we're in a commission meeting. Workshops, I think, are a little bit different because I will tell you, sometimes I forget to bring my, my laptop and then I can't check my emails unless I'm on my phone doing it. So, and sometimes I like to take a picture just so I can post it later for citizens to see. And I did that, by the way, in the last workshop that we had. I took a picture and I posted it uh, just to let the citizens know what we were covering. So I do appreciate your comments on cell phones. I would support that. I think it gets uh, commissioners in trouble a lot of times. I don't think that we need to hold them in our hands and do anything, particularly text messages uh, when we're in a meeting or in a workshop. So thank you for that comment. And may I dialogue um, with you on that, uh, sure. Madam Chairman? So I think that workshops and commission meetings, we should be respectful of the speakers and the time that they've invested and the time they're spending before us. And I would just ask that everybody leave their cell phone down. I understand a quick, a quick look at an email is not a big deal, but to stare down at it or hold it up, it's just, it's just not good. Yeah. And yeah. I will hold mine up to take a picture. To take a picture but is you will not see a it, big deal. You know, that's not what I'm talking keeping about. Keeping the citizens informed. Thank you. I, I do agree with your comments. Thank you on that. FDOT. Um, I wanted to mention that too. Um, I was very proud of one of our newly elected commissioners to get the secretary of DOT here like that. And, and it all came about from when we were in Tallahassee. Um, you know, he, he was, I mean, Com Commissioner Van Ostenbridge um, you know, point blank in the meeting that we had with DOT, brought it up and, and asked him if he would be willing to come 
um, to Manatee County, and he jumped on it. Uh, Secretary Tebalt did. So I was thrilled, um, and I, I am, I'm glad that you were able to get that done. It kind of reminded me the first year when I was elected, and I was working on um, 75 and university. Oh, they were building I-75 then? Oh, hush. You know, such abuse. Such abuse. I take it back. I'm not proud of you. You're high risk. Yeah. So, but that's what it reminded me of, truly. Oh, and I and the it was with, at the time, Secretary Passat, um, who was here. So, uh, kudos to you for that. And, and I was thrilled and very proud. Thank um, you. I appreciate the compliment. I, I do want to say that I think our new commissioners have truly added so much to this board. And, um, I, I'm really very proud and honored to serve with you on that note. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I don't think sometimes, you know, we forget, some of us that's been here for a few years, we forget what it's like when you first come up here on this dais for the first time for a meeting. And, and sometimes it's almost overwhelming when you're new. And it's not an easy task because you're trying to get your feet wet very quickly. And it's hard. And, and all of you, um, Commissioner Cruz, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, Commissioner Satcher, you have all hit it and, and run from day one. So I'm, I'm very proud of all three of you uh, for what you're trying to do for the citizens of this county. Um, that's all that I really have. Um, Commissioner Cruz, you're on the board, sir? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up real quick what you said with uh, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. I mean, that, that really was impressive and a huge benefit to Manatee County. And it, it was unfortunate, as, as Commissioner Whitmer pointed out, that it didn't get more press than it did, whether it be internally. I mean, we have a, a, a group internally that, that should be as much promoting the, the good things that all of us here on this board are doing as much as random things that, that are Manatee County global. Um, you know, when we do things like your vaccine appointments, yeah. when uh, Commissioner Servia is doing things like her town halls, these are things that we should all be working on. You know, we are running into a situation right now where there maybe is a little less trust or support of this board at, at certain times uh, on a countywide basis and maybe them seeing how much we're actually doing um, for this community and for the citizens w would be helpful to all of us. Uh, you did have the, the one article in, in the new Manatee Herald that was very fair, very balanced, very well written and it, it laid out all the, the great things that, that your meeting could have. Uh, I'm sure if you went up in a helicopter with a developer that would have been top of fold in all the other <laughs> news outlets in Manatee uh, yeah. County. Um, but. <laughs> You know, it, yeah. really well well done. I should have said it during my comments. I did share that article, and it was well-deserved, so thank you. Okay. Just to add to what Commissioner Cruz just said, you know, we're all getting ready to do our teleconference calls on hurricane preparedness. My first one is this coming week on the 24th uh, to get start letting people in my district know that, that it's available. I did send out, you know, I do a newsletter every month to my residents. Um, in my district, and um, so I did, uh, that's going out today at 6.30, letting them know that on the 24th I'll be having that. So um, looking forward to getting up and doing some more of that, and it's great that COVID is almost over, and we can now go back to having regular town hall meetings. Um, it's been a long time coming. The other thing is, thank you, Commissioner Cruz, for the motion that you made, and I will uh, talk to Vern Buchanan, and I'll try and reach him this afternoon to follow through on this. Yes, sir. Just before we close, I just wanted to let everyone know that we've been very successful with uh, DOT on the negotiations for the uh, land swap uh, to secure the property for the uh, North River Central Park, uh, Parish uh, Central Park. Um, <laughs> and and uh, we are just working with the General Counsel's Office and with the Finance Department to structure it so that we can most appropriately use the, the funds. We uh, went from $800,000 down to $400,000 uh, with a commitment that money will be used by FDOT uh, in Manatee County on Manatee County projects. So we kind of get our money back uh, and we will be uh, affecting that and bringing that agreement to you uh, as soon as possible. So I want to thank Commissioner Satcher who has uh, worked hard on this and stayed on top of it. And I think uh, we will be able to deliver a, a beautiful park uh, to the residents of, of Parish and to District 1 um, in the not too distant future. Congratulations, Mr. Satcher. Yes, sir. Did you want to?
make a comment, sir? I just wanted to add to that. Um, obviously, very exciting um, and uh, and needed. But I also wanted to uh, give a little bit of a uh, word of appreciation to the DOT. So we've been talking about the secretary, but that was specifically LK. Um, and uh, he does a great job, excellent job. Yes, Those guys uh, take care of us. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I found out things were kind of going sideways, um, I asked for that guy, for his number, <laughs> and uh, we had a great talk, and uh, things went really well from there on out. They've been behind the scenes, haven't you know uh, brought that forward uh, until everything was... Uh, we were absolutely sure, uh, but absolutely reasonable. Half his price, um, and then took that money and is going to keep it in Manatee County and more than doubles the size of that park in an area where Old Parish and New Parish meet, uh, so it's good for all of the above. And uh, thanks to Dr. Scott Hopes and uh, uh, the staff also for their uh, part on that. But, you know, and just so you know, that you know, there's other good things coming uh, that we're working on behind the scenes, and uh, there'll be... Uh, we'll reveal them in all in good time, but uh, I think um, good things happening in District 1 and in Manatee County. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Commissioner Whitmore? And at the last meeting, um, I had asked that uh, we use our reserves for that money because we have up to $1.1 million if we couldn't find it, uh, you know, to use it to, to – and we made a motion because, Commissioner Satcher, you weren't here – made a motion for um, our uh, Dr. Hopes to negotiate and hopefully get it less than 800000 But we did give authority that you could find the money, and that included our reserves if you needed to. Right. Okay. Commissioner Trying to protect our reserves. Thank you. I was <laughs> well, going to say that. I appreciate in you In all fairness, it. we never use them. Yeah. Every year, they roll over. No, that in all fairness. It's our reserves, not the board's. <laughs> it's the commissioner's reserves. Yeah. And we've got reserves, that's for sure. Point one million. And I'll, I'll say not to take anything away because he's done a lot, but uh, so I wasn't here that day, but I really I appreciate you bringing that up and being willing to do that, uh, to dip into the reserves to make that happen. I appreciate that. Um, but at that point, actually, we already had a deal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I was, you know, I wasn't here to say it, and, and uh, Dr. Hopes wasn't sure if you, you know, what I would uh, want to go forward with. But, uh, but it's going to be, it's going to be exciting, and, uh, and so we're excited about it. Good. Commissioner Van Austin Bridge. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. There's one last quick thing. I'm on the Sarasota Estuary Program and Tampa Bay, and uh, both have offered, and we can we consolidate it to come and give a. I will request it be a quick presentation on the health of the bay. Um, you know, in the, the status of the bay at this time, are any of are any of you interested? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Right yes. now, okay. should we wait? Would well, you want to do it after the recess? Okay, I'll reach out to him and take care. Uh, okay, thank you. Water's warmer. Um, Commissioner Satcher, you're on the board again. Uh, that was okay. All right, all right. I don't see anyone else on the board. Um, finally, so um, Mr. Administrator, I think we probably have a few minutes to try and complete your contract this afternoon. We haven't seemed to have been able to get to it today. It's been one thing after another. Uh, it should be back on the 25th is what we're shooting for. The, the goal is will definitely be by Friday. It, you by will. Friday. When? Yeah. Friday? Yeah, okay. the goal is yeah. Friday. Um, oh, it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Might be Monday. Did our, did our legal counsel look at? Is our legal counsel it's, involved? I'm, I'm not going to go into. He will. We're, we're taking a lot of that. We're but Bill Clegg is involved. Our I can say that. For include the legal counsel. He's involved. That's what I just said. Just want to make sure. Um, at any rate, there isn't anybody else on the board, so this meeting is adjourned. You're trying to be argumentative today.